Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from Spain. And uh, good morning to those of you who are streaming this event from Mexico, Colombia, the United States, and Peru. And good evening to those of you who are following us from uh, uh, Germany, uh, China, Japan, from the East. Welcome to this event. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this session as much as I enjoyed last um, uh, yesterday's uh, session. We have received uh, lots of private and public messages from you, so thank you for that. I'm very happy with how things uh, are going, really. I have to say this. Um, it's important for you and for us to always learn from the very best experts out there. So thank you very much for being there for us. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. This wouldn't be possible without them, the uh, Deportividad Institute, uh, whom I'd like to thank for the uh, gift, uh, Sport and Nutrition Academy, and I'd like to thank my um, colleagues from the marketing department at Real Madrid. So thank you very, very much. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to a good friend uh, and colleague, Pedro Jimenez Reyes. As most of you know, he's a lecturer at the Juan Carlos University, very close to receiving his uh, tenure. He's a researcher as well, an expert in training speed and strength. He's also um, an expert uh, trainer in uh, uh, and coach in athleticism. So good evening, Pedro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, shall I begin? Of course, anytime. Our presentations, as you know, are very uh, short. So please begin anytime you want. Thank you very much, Sergio. I'd like to thank the organizers as well. And I'd like to thank our uh, viewers for joining us, as uh, Sergio also said. So let's begin. So in this uh, talk, I'll be talking to you about the speed strength profile in sports training. One of the greatest challenges in sports training is uh, using properly all of the data we have uh, on uh, on our athletes. It's increasingly hard to uh, sort uh, this data properly, and it's increasingly hard to make accurate deci decisions in sports training based on that data. Um, it's very, very easy nowadays to source data, and um, it's easy to make mistakes, as you can see on the image, which is currently on uh, screen. So today I'd like to talk to you about how we could be using the speed strength parameter to help our athletes uh, in their day-to-day uh, -day training sessions. One of the most frequent questions that uh, lots of coaches and trainers traditionally have to deal with is which athlete can produce uh, the most force? So this is a very common question, one that many coaches and trainers often ask themselves. A question that they've been using as a guiding light in the philosophy of their training sessions with a view to maximizing uh, benefits. Rugby has been uh, the discipline that perhaps better than any other discipline has been able to define the concept of uh, strength. Um, in some very specific situations in rugby, as you can see, a lot of strength is exerted. And as a result, my question is, is, are models that are employed in rugby applicable to other disciplines as well? Because we have to ask ourselves, is speed uh, related to uh, uh, strength at all? The answer is yes, it is. So that's a difficult question to answer. 
we have this uh, dichotomy, strong and fast, force and velocity. And our muscles respond um, to these uh, kinds of uh, uh, stimuli. To give you an example, in rugby, we often apply a lot of force statically, so without any speed, without any velocity. And sometimes you have to apply little strength at high speed. So the question truly is, are we able to find and apply the best possible relationship, the best possible ratio between force and velocity? They need to be this much strong. For example, in this context, uh, they need to be this much, f um, this fast in this context. Uh, other contexts and so on and so forth. And that is applicable to training, to competition. So we've been able over the years to better explore this relationship, the existing relationship between uh, force and velocity, because we want to move away from this dichotomy. We know that our athletes need to be strong in all scenarios, um, regardless of the demands of a specific situation within the discipline, within the sports performance. This is an example. These four athletes belong to the same team, obviously. They're practicing the same sport, and we can assume they train in the same way. That's what I would assume. But each and every one of them, even if they belong to the same team, is applying force in a different context of velocity of speed. The first one of them needs to apply strength at low speed because he's just um, starting to gain momentum. Once he's done that, he jumps in as the vehicle accelerates. So the second athlete also jumps in. And before he does so, he still has to apply strength at higher speed than the first one. And the same applies to the third and fourth athletes, in particular, the fourth athlete, even though for just a couple of milliseconds, needs to keep on applying strength at very, very high speed. So all of them need to apply different amounts of force at different speeds. The same thing happens in this uh, sport, which is an individual sport. This cyclist sets off very, very quickly, as you can see. and he needs to keep it up and accelerate as he races around the circuit. So his force velocity ratio is ever changing in this context. And the same thing happens in other sports as well. As a result, it's important that our coaches and trainers be able to explore the complete force velocity profile. To be more specific, they need to be able to correctly explore the specific context of each and every athlete in each and every situation. So we've been studying this for a long time because uh, the literature, the academic literature, up until uh, actually not too long ago, claimed that uh, the stronger you are, the faster you are. Uh, that is true, actually, for a number of uh, different disciplines, and a number of publications seem to agree on that. That's been our starting point, uh, the starting point for our research. Uh, our research question basically was, if stronger actually equals faster, then an athlete who's able to exert this much force in this context, they should also be able to exert as much force in the opposite context. We tried to verify this hypothesis. So that was what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is the hypothesis based on the work carried out by other uh, researchers in the past. But it turned out that stronger athletes aren't necessarily able to exert as much strength at high speed as they are while static. So our conclusion was that basically being strong at low velocity doesn't necessarily mean that you will also be strong at high velocity. And uh, 
Purely because as an athlete, you're able to exert more maximal force, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're also able to achieve higher speeds, higher uh, velocity, maximal velocity. As a matter of fact, some of the fastest runners in the world do not appear uh, to have as much body mass as uh, other athletes, athletes from other disciplines. So on the one end of the spectrum, we have force at low speed, F0. The other end of the spectrum, we have V0, so high speed, um, low force. The combination, the ratio between these two points is what we call Pmax, uh, maximal power, maximum power. This FV profile is independent of uh, Pmax. And that is important. It's an important uh, concept to, uh, to keep in mind, to uh, train properly. Athletes with higher Pmax have uh, different profiles. As you see, the first athlete, the one with the dotted line, seems to be stronger statically the second athlete seems to be faster and yet they're able to produce the same pmax that's due uh, to uh, inherent differences in athletes even within the same team or sport and then another thing we have been able to confirm through science is that if we specifically specifically train some specific areas of this uh, profile we're better able to improve both areas, so both force and velocity. That means that the FV profile is sensitive to specific training. I'd just like to remind you at this point that the FV profile can be evaluated vertically and horizontally. Let's start by talking about the vertical FV profile. Here, we mechanically evaluate force, velocity, and power. We're well aware of the characteristics of the athlete, and so we're able to correctly differentiate between athletes. So push off distance, uh, jump height, mass load, that's known as HPO. The height the athlete is able uh, to achieve at each and every jump uh, without any load, we also measure, we also measure mass plus load. This protocol has been validated scientifically, and by doing that, we are able to create this vertical FV profile, which accounts for these three characteristics. By measuring it, we're also able to create an optimal profile for the athlete, which often doesn't match the current profile, which means that the athlete um, has a potential to improve. So, even if two athletes are able to exert the same max power, we know that they're able to do so for different reasons. But the question is, how can they improve? Uh, thanks to this uh, mathematical model created by Samozino, we know that there is an optimal FV profile. If we integrate these uh, individual characteristics that we mentioned earlier, HPO and max power, and max power once again accounts for different profiles that can achieve it. For, if they're able to achieve this, which is known as slow for uh, force velocity, we're also able to impact performance, jumping, the jumping performance of our athlete. And by doing that, our athletes are able to get closer to their optimal FV profile. And little by little, uh, athletes' performance will improve. And that's the essence, truly, of this methodology, because uh, 
it shows that we're able to modify this profile and that by doing that we're able to reach the optimal fv profile that maximizes our jumper performance as we can see here if on the other hand we focus on a profile that specifically um, uh, focused on strength and profile, we can lose up to 30% uh, of jumping performance. So that's a mathematical model that's now become experimental evidence because experiments have been uh, conducted, field experiments with uh, uh, real athletes, both with um, uh, squat jumps and CMJs. Uh, they both yielded the same results. So it's an important mathematical model for all of us. So this is a mathematical, practical, confirmed, validated model. You can see some uh, pictures here of real-time athletes. That's a very common situation with some weights in a platform. So the most important variables towards uh, vertical jump are Pmax uh, HPO and FV max. So this force velocity profile uh, that we looked at in the previous equation. We know that th starting from this FV imbalance, we can better train our athletes, better plan our training sessions. By doing that, we will find that some athletes have a force deficit, like in this particular case, and some other times, we'll come across athletes who have a velocity deficit because, meaning that their uh, optimal profile would actually make them faster. So these are the two typical situations that we can be faced with, a force deficit or a velocity deficit. Probably sometimes we'll also find athletes who have a well-balanced profile meaning with no force or velocity deficits, simply because that real, the actual profile uh, corresponds with the optimal profile. So if we want to train this, we have to be aware of the existence of this area, the F0 area, which is close to the RM area with heavy loads, and another area, the V0 area, where um, most sports training jumps are located, like squat jumps or uh, uh, squat jumps HZT, which we'll be talking about later. And then there's a middle area, um, which uh, is more closely related to power, to Pmax. So if we're well aware of um, what happens in these three areas, our coaches, our trainers will be able to figure out which area needs improvement for a specific athlete. We've actually been able to ascertain through uh, our studies that the closer you get to RM, the more likely the model is uh, to give accurate predictions relating to F0. And the same goes for squat jumps, the closer you get to V0. So the closer you get to V0, the more accurate predictions our model is able to produce. We also conducted a study with professional athletes in order to find out the, well, how effective individualized training based on this force velocity profile would be during jumping. So the specificity of exercise is something you have to take into account. Of course, in our research, we worked with a, a limited number of specific exercises, but obviously in our day-to-day -day lives, you can also work with other 
exercise it so long as they comply with the stimulation criteria relative to each and every one of these areas. So as a brief summary, we uh, sorted our athletes by category, depending on whether they had a force deficit, a velocity deficit, or whether they were well balanced. And we planned out their training sessions um, accordingly. So if an athlete had a force deficit, they would work on F0. If they were well balanced, they would work in the middle area. If they had a velocity deficit, they would work on their uh, V0 area. Results, those subjects who worked uh, according to this model improved their uh, jump height. They increased their jumping height. Scientific literature claimed that by training maxim, maximum strength, you would achieve the same benefits as you would by training maximum velocity. But um, in our study, actually, we have been able to have all subjects improve regardless. So this was the uh, optimized group that trained in order to improve its uh, uh, performance. The control group only improved by 2%. So here, this is the situation, uh, the starting point for our athletes before the study started. And this is the optimal FV profile. All of our athletes, except for one who did not show any improvements in terms of force deficit, possibly because he needed more time, or possibly because uh, he struggled uh, throughout the training sessions, they all improved. But the most interesting question is this, we knew what each and every athlete needed. We knew what the goal for each and every athlete was. And we know that in those cases where we didn't account for that, our athletes didn't improve. And uh, probably the most uh, simple thing that you can do with this, because uh, this and, uh, Athletes uh, have this need for uh, for force, so that's what you can do. But how can we improve this uh, velocity deficit? Well, we need to think of uh, exercises that uh, stimulate that area for a uh, high-speed application of a... And so, what uh, various people recommend is that, well, we need to develop certain devices where the contraction and, and the, the velocity can be higher than usual, such as in, uh, in these jumps. And so they developed this device so that athletes didn't have to uh, face up to their own body weight. And so we could see how this exercise can be done, which is the one we call a horizontal squat. So you can see that we're achieving these velocity and force uh, objectives. And this uh, goes along with what uh, Markovic and others have said. That's quite a simple device, but uh, if you don't have it, you can do other exercises, like here you see Maureen doing the same exercise because it's meeting the same criteria, because when he starts to concentric, there's uh, a, a very high velocity, so he's not going above his body weight. And you can see it here. 
with the help of this uh, elastic band. When the athlete pulls down, this energy is then being put into the elastic, and so that when this concentric phase begins, speed is very great. So the, the velocity can be a lot higher than the normal jump. See here how the horizontal the um, SJ. So we can then consider various different training possibilities. So with the two legs, with the one leg, with the bouncing, reducing impact on the, the athletes as well. There's various different lines of research possible here and different for various athletes. And so the main conclusion of this part of the, the uh, vertical force velocity is to create a training program which is personalized to improve the vertical uh, uh, jump and uh, because many of them don't take into account the uh, force uh, velocity profile of each athlete. And this can also then be converted into a, a powerful tool to help us optimize the force velocity profile and uh, increase the maximum force and to increase the height of the jump. It's very easy to assess jump and the force velocity profile And uh, we can also see a clear example of an athlete who needed 25 weeks to get to his or her top uh, optimum level. And there's a significant uh, increase in the height. This is the practical side. This is a, we can see how this methodology can help us uh, in these issues. We know that in a lot of sports, the capacity to, to sprint, to accelerate, to change direction is essential. And so there's also a force velocity profile in horizontal directions as well, which we can see in sprints. Now, before we start with the force velocity profile, it's important to understand how force is involved. In, uh, in a sprinter. Here you can see the time velocity curve, how the contact time changes, and most importantly, how the position changes from when they start being very uh, inclined and, and how his body becomes more vertical. Now this change of position also has a, an effect on how force is applied. So at the beginning, the horizontal force, is, which is represented in red, are very important in order to be able to achieve this displacement forward. But as he becomes more vertical, the vertical forces are more important. And when the athlete is at the maximum speed, the vertical forces are really important. And they determine his uh, output at maximum speed because at that point, they're, they're stabilized. So if you take into account this application of force throughout the sprint, we see how there are certain conditioning factors that can determine things, and they can determine what sort of exercises are required. We can see how the beginning, the horizontal force is the most important one. In the second part, where we've there's been some verticalization, and we've increased the amplitude and frequency and reduced the application of force or the time available for applying force. And here there's a balance between vertical and horizontal forces. And finally, we have the maximum speed phase where there's very little time available to apply force, and there's a balance between amplitude and frequency and the vertical force, uh, which is really determinant for, the, for performance. So it was the same approach for the vertical profile. We see that when we calculate the force velocity profile, 
or derived from this uh, velocity speed uh, curve. We can synthesize this curve of velocity time and we get areas that are well differentiated, such as the F0 and the area of V0 and the power uh, area, the, the, the force area. And uh, so we can see what the, the right exercises will be uh, to stimulate each one of these areas, as we've seen for the vertical profile. So uh, as you mentioned before, we have to take into account the specificity of each exercise to see whether they are suited to this particular context. There's a very specific context of, of uh, it could be high speed, low, low force, or the other way around. So what is the force velocity profile in the sprint? Well, it's quite simply the application of force as the velocity changes. So it's an inverse relationship between force and velocity, also as we see in the force velocity profile vertically. All of this is determined by the change in posture as we run. And there are two main variables, which are F0 and RF. In RF, it's the, ratio, the force ratio. And what it tells us is what percentage of horizontal force do we apply at the beginning? Now, if you're not familiar with these, this profile, I'd just like to say that the F0 and the force ratio can be equivalent to what we know in the gym as the, uh, as the R, just as a way of understanding it. Now, as we accelerate, the involvement of horizontal, sorry, vertical force is going to change as our speed increases. And so a drop in this uh, force ratio, which is called the DRF, which is the reduction in the force ratio. And we see these different situations here. Three athletes that start from the same initial force ratio, but as the speed in the race increases, only one of them is able to continue to apply a high percentage of horizontal force. And so it's a lot more effective than the other two runners. And this has got a lot to do with technical aspects uh, in athletes. Okay, and how can we calculate this variable? Well, what we do know is that uh, when we have the velocity time curve of the runner, that's adjusted to an exponential model, however fast or slow we are. So using this velocity time curve, this exponential curve, we do a derivation and an integration of this exponential function. And what we get is the acceleration and space in terms of time. So once you've calculated the velocity time curve in a very simple way, using not very complicated calculations, we can get the force velocity profile with various variables, F0 and V0, and the interaction that produces maximum uh, potential, and the DRF. And how do we calculate this uh, force? Well, it's quite simple. With the uh, velocity time curve and with the derivatives, we get the acceleration. If we know that force equals mass times acceleration, well, we know that uh, we can then calculate it quite simply. We can get the force velocity profile quite easily. So when we do a force velocity profile in our athletes, we have two large areas that are well differentiated, which is the F0 and the force ratio in the first part of the uh, maximum uh, power, and then we've got a DRF, which is the second part. So what's our target then? Well, we need to choose the best exercises for uh, stimulating these different parts of the force velocity profile. So how can we calculate this force velocity curve? Well, the first issue is we can, we can do it with a radar, which is the simplest way of doing it, because it, it registers, records the, the velocity at all points of t in time. We can also use photocells to calculate it, but then we would need a pressure template to know at what point the athlete starts to apply pressure. 
in order to calculate this velocity's uh, time curve. And then we can also calculate it by looking at a video, which is the idea that we had. So that a lot of uh, trainers can use this because we know that not all trainers have radars or uh, photocells. So that they, we can then calculate this uh, force uh, velocity profile. So along with Maurice and, uh, and other colleagues, we came up with the idea to develop an application called MySprint in which we can calculate just by recording a high-speed race uh, and, and in slow motion and we can calculate the various different parts of the, uh, of the race and we can calculate these uh, we can just use the mobile phone to calculate this so why is it important to calculate the force velocity profile? Well, it's important because we can have situations like this where we have two athletes in the team who do a 30 meter test and you see how they get to 30 at the same time. But of course, their accelerating capacity is very, very different. So what are decision as a, as a trainer? If we just have a photo cell to, if, if they've done things in the same time in 30 meters, well, it's likely that the two train in the same way, only one of them is going to benefit because this type of standard training is perhaps uh, better for the one who accelerates well. well. What happens if we find this situation where the, the two of them accelerate exactly the same rate, but then they're very different afterwards in the maximum speed section? Well, here's the same thing. Both of them are going to have different needs. One of them, despite having the same mechanical abilities, one of them is likely that he's going to need to improve his F0, and the other one is going to need to improve uh, the V0. So it was on this basis that we can train using this FV spectrum. And there are three main areas. There's the area of high force and low s speed, and there's a, s a time of maximum power. And there's this other area here of ap applying maximum, applying force at maximum speed. So, so we need to be precise to know where we need to work with our athletes. In this area of uh, this has a lot to do with the beginning of the, the curve, with high force and low velocity. And then we've got another area at the end of the curve where we've got maximum velocity, where the technical aspect is very important, where is V0 and DRF. Because in this context, there's lower force and high velocity. So you have this in the chapter of the, uh, of the book. And I'm describing it here for the second in, uh, edition, but uh, everything there is, is very much uh, more in depth. I don't know if I went too quickly, but I wanted you to have a, a view of the two uh, profiles, of the really the philosophy of how we do this, and above all, how we can uh, have this uh, practical application for our day-to-day -day, uh, work. I don't know if there are any questions. Again, thank you very much. Yes, better. don't worry. That was a brilliant uh, presentation. We always have to go quickly because that's the, our model, so don't worry. It's been very, very good. There are a lot of questions. We don't have much time, but if it's okay, I'm going to ask you two or three. Just basically then, what type of jumps you use? And uh, and also, what percentage of the scale do you evaluate with these uh, sorts of examples? Yes, the, the jump profile, vertical jump, can be done in the SJ and CMJ. The Alakov, it can't be done because as you need to jump with uh, a, a weight, then uh, I don't think it would be uh, so reliable. And also, there's the issue for assessments, uh, which above all CMJ, 
and SJ. Now regarding the Borg scale, we haven't measured it because it's not a test. It doesn't put you to the limit, bring you to the limit. And so it's a test that can be done quite comfortably and we haven't measured it. Okay, very good. We have various uh, questions on hypertrophy. But perhaps it's better to leave that to Jorge, because it, but if you want to say something on that. Uh, and then also there's a question on the type of fibers. If you think the type of fiber can uh, can influence strength athletes uh, and for different uh, profiles. Yes, in fact, there is a study uh, on muscle architecture. But the, but the important thing about the force velocity profile is that it has to be individualized. And we take into account these individual aspects. So within that mathematical model, we also take into account the properties of fiber. So although there might be more resistance, uh, and uh, we know that there's a, a high amount of uh, slow fibers, it's very much recommendable to have the force velocity profile because in the end it's going to be adapted to the the the, the possibilities that they have and so uh, they don't need to worry about that and and you can see the more, more general picture and, uh, and sometimes going into too much details doesn't um, really provide any benefit yes i agree okay last question this could be work as a summary Now, we know that your presentation is open, it's on YouTube. But Pedro says, how do you define the optimum profile for force velocity what, for those variables? So as a summary, perhaps as the last question. Yes, there is a, an optimum profile for each athlete and for each speciality and also particular profiles. What we have so far is an article with more than 14 sports and both men and women. So that's perhaps the best reference for comparing whether the, uh, the athletes and their uh, team and their speciality um, are complying, are, are, are in line with what the literature has said because if each, each pro sport has its optimum profile. But you have to go to the individual athlete and see whether they meet the standards of the speciality. All of this requires more development because for each uh, sport, for some there aren't any articles and others there, there's maybe 60, 80 subjects for each sport. And, and you can characterize it, you can just profile to some degree in sport to some degree, yes, but uh, you really need to characterize the athlete and then study the demand. Okay, thank you very much, Pedro. This has been a great uh, presentation. If it's okay, we're going to have 30 seconds of a break to be able to connect to Jorge, and then we'll begin. Okay, thanks very much, Pedro. Thank you very much. If you want Pedro's contact, it was in the the presentation, but here you have it again if you want to ask any questions because he's always available for that. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.
Buenas tardes de nuevo. Disculpar que hemos Good tenido un again. problema de conexión. So we had a little connection problem there. For the next bueno, speaker. But everything is now ready. And I'm uh, very happy to be able to present a, uh, a colleague from the university of uh, the, the same university, but from Canary Islands. And he's a doctor, Jorge Miguel González uh, Fernández, who's going to talk about uh, cluster as a proposal within uh, strength training. And uh, he got a lot of experience in um, in football in, in uh, Tenerife. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for accepting the invitation and uh, welcome. Everyone has a lot of expectation with this, uh, this because under the cluster is very much in fashion. So go ahead. Hello, good morning, uh, Sergio. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Yes, it's a great pleasure to be here as well. Now, today I'm going to talk about the clusters, you said. And I'm going to, uh, going to talk about some uh, recent uh, researches this year. It's important to, uh, to know that during uh, strength training, there are different variables that are going to alternate the response that we, uh, we generate, such as the new number of series, number of repetitions, the recovery time, the uh, burden used, the repetitions, the type of uh, force that we're going to apply. And if we uh, give priority to centric or concentric, uh, uh, and so during strength training, we ask what happens if we change these variables? If you recover more, we recover less. If you prioritize the, the centric or concentric uh, phase. And definitely, we have to be clear that the, the body adapts to the stimulates that we produce in it. So it's very important to know the effects that uh, you get when by producing different configurations in strength, such as different recovery times, the t different types of uh, uh, strength. And so this way we can optimize our program to avoid injuries on the one hand, but also to improve performance. So we can be better adapted. Now it's important to understand the concept of, and the nature of, uh, of force. Here we have three different uh, series. So three sets of 10. So there's a weight that we do 10 repetitions with, compared to a training where we do six series of five with the same weight the same overall volume, but the training is very different in terms of how it's organized. The first one would be you continue until you can no longer continue, whereas the second one would be a training where we leave half of them undone. And so here you can see the, uh, the software of Open Core, where we can see how the speed affects things. When we train with in the second form, it's more constant. In literature, there's a big dilemma between uh, these two different uh, approaches. In training until failure, uh, and non-failure treatment is, uh, is for improving uh, performance. In 2013, they were already talking about these uh, cluster approaches. It was Gregory Haft that started this uh, who started, who started working with these repetitions between uh, small groups of series or between series. Here we can see the, uh, the uh, velocity within a series without recovery in between. And we can see the other one on the right-hand side, the cluster trainings where we can maintain the uh, velocity. So this is from 2016, and you can see the clearest examples or most commonly used examples for cluster training with groups of repetitions. So we do four repetitions and then a small break and then another four. And you, and you recover between each repetition. So we do a repetition, we recover, and then another repetition. And nowadays, there, there are other, there's another method which redistributes the breaks. The same recovery time into, as traditional uh, method, but we divide it between the repetitions. Now, the aim of all of this is to, is to work on ATP. That way, we can be better uh, prepared for the next training session. And in the literature, it, uh, there are various different studies 
where we've seen the cluster produces greater oxidization and f lower levels of uh, fatigue. In this uh, study, with, uh, with this uh, collaboration, we studied various different uh, training protocols, uh, traditional ones, three different series of, uh, of uh, three, three uh, of 10 until exhaustion and then uh, five and then the cluster where we recover five, 10 and 15 seconds between repetitions. And we were able to see that the it drops exponentially for uh, training until exhaustion. Whereas uh, the cluster protocols or not until exhaustion, which is the six times five, have a much more reduced uh, loss in velocity as we can see here. So the, the loss in velocity uh, until exhaustion, we can see a loss of 40% compared to a loss of about 10%. And this is related to certain concentrations. It is greater for the traditional one than for the cluster uh, protocols until exhaustion. Now, through the training cluster, we can also get a greater volume of training. And here we see a... a a study from 2014 where we can see compares uh, three times four until exhaustion and then a recovery in three minutes and then cluster training recovering 36 seconds between repetitions and you can see that with with this system you can only do a certain number of repetitions and you can see they're not even able to do the two repetitions, whereas then the protocol, the clutch protocol, with 36 seconds, between uh, repetitions, uh, they're able to have uh, 36 repetitions with this, uh, with this button, which presumably they're able to do four repetitions with. On the other hand, they've seen that in this study, in 2013, that they've used cluster and uh, sit-ups with uh, 5 RM, And they see that the, the jump height improves. And they compared it with a 33 sec second uh, break. Uh, and uh, they saw that over the minute of doing this, the, the protocol increases, increases improvement compared to protocol up to exhaustion. Whereas at nine minutes of training, the power was greater for uh, training up to exhaustion, and therefore it's a the method for increasing potential. Cluster training also helps us in terms of perceived effort. You, you will uh, be able to uh, see this in the next slide. Cluster training is effective in producing less perceived Effort. This study, which was published in May, shows that exhaustion training on a scale from 1 to 10 would produce a perceived uh, sensation of effort of 9 to 10. Cluster training on a bench press, 7. Conversely, with uh, squats, we've been able to appreciate how a perceived uh, sensation of effort in regular training was 9.37. In cluster training was 8.62. So in this case, cluster training helps us in terms of uh, perception of effort, even if we use the same loads as uh, regular training. And in this other study, which was published in 2012, we showed that in cluster training with 20 seconds rest between reps, we're able to maintain the proper execution technique. We've been able to appreciate that there were there was less of a variation in uh, the technique of execution uh, in cluster training. All of this, in summary, means that cluster training can offer better performance with less fatigue. This is also backed by this article published in 2020. The article shows that cluster training has acute effects whereby we 
perform better during training and we build up fewer metabolites. So it's an effective strategy. This other study, which was published this year, essentially uh, PhD, my PhD thesis, which I wrote with Pedro, uh, the previous speaker, and other friends. We looked at uh, different perceptions of effort while training squats in cluster training. We found um, interesting evidence for different protocols, a protocol leading to exhaustion, a protocol that would not lead to exhaustion, and finally a cluster protocol with varying rest uh, times uh, 15 to 30 seconds in between uh, repetitions, uh, total training for this training 15 to 20 minutes. And finally, we also looked at another protocol that had never been looked at before, 30 repetitions with 10 seconds rest in between in 10 minutes overall. The video shows how the study was conducted. One rep squats, then the athlete moved on, S, uh, CMJs in this case, and then the subject, after 30 seconds, uh, was analyzed for lactate metabolites. In this case, we see that execution speeds uh, lowers as uh, we go forward in our reps. And this is cluster training, 10 seconds rest in between reps. The blue bar shows execution speed and it's a lot more consistent. So there are no significant variations between uh, reps compared with traditional training. This is another example of cluster training with 15 second uh, rest periods. So one squat, you put the bar down and you rest for 15 seconds. So we can observe here that the traditional protocol, so exhaustion protocol, shows a significant reduction in uh, uh, velocity, 56.6% compared with the with the first rep. With the, in cluster training, the loss amounted to 12.8%, and the protocol with 30 seconds rest between reps led to a 7.9% reduction. These uh, differences between the two cluster protocols aren't actually significant. Uh, so whether you recover 15 or 30 seconds, in between reps and tells the difference in the total uh, work and time of the session, of course. So in one case, the session will be shorter, but in terms of uh, loss of uh, execution technique, no significant uh, differences. In this case, we can see that uh, loss in jump height is a lot less significant in cluster training compared to traditional training. And in this other graph, we were able to appreciate that with 30 reps, 15 seconds rest in between entailed virtually no uh, risk of height loss in CMJs. It is possible that with a higher load, the protocol could be even more appropriate. It would lead to better uh, strengthening. And as regards lactate production, here we can appreciate how exhaustion training produces much higher levels of lactate than cluster training. Finally, if we take the omni scale into account regarding effort perception, the average value for traditional training is 8.4 for 10 minute sessions. In cluster training, the perceived effort 
is a lot lower. Execution time is also lower, 8.5 minutes. And in other protocols, no significant uh, variation was uh, observed with um, an omni value of between 7.2 and 6.8 and uh, session time varying between 15 and 26 minutes. So with the uh, cluster training, we know that we have less fatigue and uh, less execution time. In this study, which I did in Chile, along uh, with a colleague, we looked at 31 subjects by comparing three training protocols, acute training. A traditional protocol with uh, three minutes rest every 10 reps, a cluster uh, set configuration, 30 seconds rest every two reps, and a rest distribution set, 45 seconds rest every two reps. These are the results. Much like in previous studies, in terms of maximum speed and load redistribution, the traditional protocol performed more poorly than uh, the cluster training protocol. This is um, a video showing the execution of an advanced bench press exercise. So low loads, explosive execution to reach the velocity peak. We measured frame velocity before and after training, and all three protocols were significantly affected in terms of um, force generation capacity at high speed, uh, both in CMJs and advanced bench press, I should say. Regarding perception of fatigue and effort, the traditional protocol led to a higher perception compared with uh, cluster and uh, redistribution set configurations, both in bench presses and squats. So higher values in squats than bench press. We've all done squats and bench press, and we know that the muscular um, the demand of the second exercise is a lot higher than the first one. In this other study, we looked at the chronic response stemming from cluster training. We were able to observe, oh, we worked with 39 subjects. 13 of them trained traditionally, 13 of them with a redistribution configuration, 13 of them with a cluster configuration, 12 training sessions, uh, six a week for two weeks. In traditional training, we had uh, six sets of five reps. In a redistribution group, we had 31 with uh, 10 second with 31 second uh, rests in between and in cluster training same thing in 15 minutes the exercises we took into account were uh, throwing bench press and uh, handball throwing speed So we wanted to see if uh, any improvement in strength could be appreciated in specific exercises um, compared especially to a classic uh, strength training exercise like the bench press with 30 kilograms. In the upper part of the panel, you can see how we compared traditional training with uh, redistribution training. The difference that was appreciated after two weeks of training are very, very evident in uh, uh, handball throw and in bench press, in throwing bench press. We also compared the response in traditional protocol, in the traditional protocol and, the, and in the cluster protocol. Uh, mind you, in this case, the traditional protocol wasn't in this case until exhaustion, so better RM levels and better uh, throwing speed, throwing velocity in both exercises. But uh, in 
the redistribution configuration in the control group and the cluster group, we had uh, even greater improvements. As you can see here, the traditional protocol it was not until exhaustion. for both exercises, advanced bench press and handball throwing. Uh, these values can be affected when you train with high loads, as we said earlier. So um, it is preferable to work with lower loads so you can achieve higher uh, speeds, higher throwing. Um, speeds. So I'm sorry if I sort of zoomed through this, but we've finally come to uh, the key idea of this uh, talk. First conclusion, it's not necessary to train to exhaustion. Uh, rest time between series and the redistribution of rest time is an effective method for gaining strength and in order to better recover between uh, training sessions, so to reduce fatigue. And finally, cluster is ideal for um, uh, subjects who are not experienced and uh, who do not compete. But it's also ideal for people who compete because it reduces fatigue. So it uh, allows athletes to improve performance uh, even before a competition. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions now. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for respecting our time uh, limit. We have quite a few questions for you. Paula asks, well, we got this question uh, uh, when still you hadn't explained what cluster training actually uh, was. Uh, she wonders what uh, cluster training consists in. So I was hoping you can give us a couple of examples of uh, what cluster training is. Okay, then cluster training. In, in the literature, cluster training consists in inter-series rest and inter-repetition rest. Example, I do one squat, I recover 30 seconds, I do another squat and I recover and so on. You can also do, for example, three reps and then you rest for 15, 20, 30 seconds. That's also cluster training. As I said earlier in my presentation, this is going to affect our adaptation in some way. If we rest in between each rep, this is aimed at uh, explosive training without losing, losing speed. Whereas uh, if you rest every three reps, for example, you improve your tolerance to uh, your resistance, your endurance in explosive training. So cluster training is generally compared to uh, training, uh, traditional training protocols, also in terms of training sessions. Thank you. Jorge Morales asks, If you have the same effects in terms of metabolic response and hypertrophy in traditional training and in cluster training, well, it depends on how you structure your training. One of the key things you can do to improve mechanic tension and improve hypertrophy, so better training volume. For example, in our cluster training protocol is we're resting 15 seconds in between reps and comparing it to 13 to 30 second uh, rest. So in traditional training, you produce more metabolic stress, but you can perform less, uh, fewer reps. So if you take both clusters into account, 
we can appreciate that uh, if, uh, for example, you rest for 15 seconds in between reps as opposed to 30 seconds, you produce more metabolic stress. So that's one option if you want hypertrophy. Uh, you can rest, for example, for 10 or 20 seconds. If you want to train hypertrophy, you can do that in cluster training by uh, resting fewer seconds in between reps. Thank you. In cluster training, do you select few exercises considering uh, it basically takes less to perform an exercise to completion compared uh, to traditional training? Yeah, cluster training is an example that uh, more isn't always better. In pre-competition, uh, you can uh, choose a different set of exercises, uh, of course, but still organize them in a um, clustered uh, configuration. It will still work. And what type of recommendations do you have for team sports in terms of clusters? Well, in team sports, you have to think in terms of strength training. We all know what that is about uh, sharing time with the, the coach. And one proposal is to have uh, a brief session and to, and to have a microdosis of cluster trainings in which you can then do various different exercises with recoveries of 15, 20 seconds between each repetition. And the organizer that way, we can then uh, improve performance. Two more questions, okay? Is it recommended to do a, a lower percentage of uh, RM, or does that not make sense? Do we doing clusters? Well, there's a lot of research that needs to be done in that. Now, training with clusters with uh, low loads, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Now, with higher loads, we, include, we improve the ratio, but it could be a good strategy to improve that part of uh, um, for that type of exercise. Now, there's another question here. Santi Muñoz. Sergio uh, is going to be talking about uh, something similar. They're saying that, do you think that the high intensity exercises with brief pauses to be sufficient to gain time compared to traditional uh, methods? Well, I like all of this uh, training dynamics and that's why I propose it because uh, I see the benefits and in terms of the technique. Uh, so I think that uh, I always propose these sorts of trainings when we want to do more repetitions and therefore, when there's more uh, mechanical stress. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jorge. It's been a great, it's been a pleasure listening to you, talking about clusters. Oh, you understand this concept very well, and we've learned a lot with you. Well, I'm happy that you've learned. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, we'll see each other in the next session. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have another minute to connect to Sergio. And we're talking about sporting lesions. Thank you very much.
So welcome again to another presentation. I have the great pleasure to present Amito Cayo, uh, someone I've worked with uh, for many, many years, Dr. Sergio Jiménez Rubio. He's uh, worked with the, uh, the top team of Getafe. He's uh, spent uh, many years uh, working with the best players. He's an, an expert in prevention and uh, treatment of sports injuries. And he's going to give a very practical approach on methodologies and uh, on various different methodologies. So I, I'm going to... Germán is going to then uh, moderate what I have to go train. But uh, I hope that you find Sergio's uh, speech very interesting. And I hope you enjoy it. So thanks very much, uh, Sergio, for accepting and for coming to the symposium. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for this invitation. And thanks to the institutions, the, the uh, Real Madrid Foundation, the, uh, the European University. I've been working many years in this master's on, on sports and nutrition. And it's great to be here in this in third international symposium. In, in today's workshop, which is focused above on health and, and uh, training. So it's, uh, I feel very proud uh, that, uh, that you're interested in this area of, uh, of sports injuries, which is obviously related to health, because this is the main impediment to remaining healthy. And of course, related to training because the focus that, uh, that I've always had in this area is that there's no better way of recovering from an injury than training. You have to keep moving. Now, within what we're going to talk about today, Sergio asked me to focus on the specific types of injuries, and because uh, there are certain things that are being reviewed and uh, related to quadriceps, So the focus is going to be on that. Now, it's in English, because this is something that we've been trying to disseminate. To, and so we want it to be as international as possible. I'm going to talk about the reconditioning uh, and prevention uh, process of the, the rectofemoral in uh, injured football players. There are, there are five points. I'm going to talk about the epidemiology and the, uh, the uh, femoris and the preventative aspect, the joint by joint approach. We're going to look at recent research 
in the um, in the rectus femoris in the high performance soccer, and then we'll look at a a real case in the possible return to play and how we can control the load and what sort of criteria we use to help with the injury and to make decisions in the returning to training and returning to play. And finally, some thoughts, some final conclusions and questions you need to ask. Now we're going to talk about the uh, anthropal, uh, the, the focus is always going to be global, even though we're talking about one particular part of the body. Now we have to see how the structure is, especially with the information that we're receiving uh, from uh, x-rays and, uh, and, and ultrasounds, but the focus always has to be based on the player coming back in good health overall, and even, in even perhaps better conditions than when he uh, was injured. So it's not just exclusively based on one muscle and one structure, and exercise is just for that muscle. The approach should be more holistic. It should be a, a more global to approaching the, the, the athlete as a whole. So when there is an injury, obviously we propose a treatment and we have the, the right staff and there's a whole process in, re in rehab and reconditioning so that the athlete can return to the, the game. And there are sudden studies where there's, a, there's about return to training, return to sport, return to participation. It's the same general concept. And, this, it, and essentially, it's about return to performance. But what I want to show in this whole sequence when there's an injury is the final part. In the end, the decisions, with all the information available, is a complex issue, but it's the coach who has to make this decision with the athlete. Now, this is something that I like to repeat in all my presentations because that is an important truth. With all the years of experience and different uh, technical teams and the different people who make decisions, coaches, athletes, what you see is that when there are injuries, you have to obtain information about what's going to happen. Uh, but the final decision for returning to play is going to be based on a, f a discussion between the athlete and the, the coach. So let's um, talk uh, about the, uh, the rectus femoris. It's a very special muscle because it's uh, articular. It, 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 it's just connected to the knee. It's made of, of a direct tendon and an indirect tendon. These are anatomical aspects, but we have to understand this and, and uh, take this into account when the when you have to re-educate the... Uh, now, the rectus femoris is a muscle group which is the second most common injury um, in football. It makes up 19% of all muscle injuries, the rectus femoris. But it's not just about the number of injuries in the rectus femoris, but it's also what this involves. We see that it's about 13% of re-injuries that occur with the rectus femoris. There are some um, papers um, that even break it down into how these re-injuries take place, whether they're short, medium, or long-term. And we see that they create a significant problem in terms of a re-injury. So we need to have an optimum return of the, the athlete in a similar or even better condition, and also how to avoid re-injuries. Now, in terms of the injury mechanisms and how the rectus femoris is injured, well, the, the, the literature, there's 2002 author, there's more recent authors, they divide it into two main types of injury. There are sprint, the sprinting injury mechanism, 
and that can be put in, that can be divided into more different uh, detail. And then there's also the kicking injury mechanism. And so that's important in, t in terms of how we re-educate, how we retrain, because if the athlete may be able to achieve certain things in the recovery process, but these mechanisms, like the standard, uh, like a gold standard, until you can get to the final phase and you can re-educate the the profile, you don't know exactly how well they're responding to the exercises. Now, amongst the sprint, I'd like to, to show you this recent study of, of uh, Howard and collaborators in 2018. And here we can see that uh, there's the swing phase and the stand phase, where the, the foot is... Uh, we see that uh, the flexors are that are involved have greater volumes of, of force when the foot is not supported, when it's in the swing phase. And in this 20 degree swing, that is the point, or one of the points within the sprint when this injury is most likely to happen, when there's most uh, likely to suffer in the rectus femoris. And so we propose tasks to recover from these uh, injuries on that basis. Another point in which the force creates this injury within sprints uh, is the, the deceleration phase or the stance phase. When there's a, a, a strong control, concentric control, and Howard and Collaborator talked about that, and they see how this is a second set of situations in which uh, you create these injuries. So we have to understand that you need a high speed hip movements in order to generate protection. Now we're going to talk a bit more about uh, how important it is to assess, and that's very important, assess the pelvis of the, uh, the athlete to understand all of this. So for example, if you've got um, psoas of more than 90 degrees, now within, uh, when you're in the recovery phase, you have to understand this is very important in the, the, in the hip flexion. So you need to generate protection in terms of the uh, in this this uh, this type of injury. Now the other major group are is in kicking the kicking injury mechanism. Now we've seen in the literature literature how important it is to generate stability and strength in the proximal area in the core, the center of the body to be able to also generate the right tension and effective force in the distal area. So that's where the foot is, where the ball is, where, where the kicking takes place. So here we see the exterior uh, um, flexion. Now, in the second part of the speech, I'd like to talk about the importance of assessment. Now, it's very different when we have an athlete in the posterior, posterior pelvic and the anterior pelvic uh, tilt. So the type of pelvic tilt is very important. If it's an antiversion or retroversion, is key to understand what the best approach is for the erectus femoris. So you've got a post posterior tilt. You, it's basic to train the hip flexion drills are very, very useful for the posterior pelvic tilt. And so that uh, that's when you've got psoas of more than 90 degrees. <clears throat> so the lift off and and, uh, and the idea is to re-educate the future technique. However, if you've got a, an athlete with an anterior pelvic tilt, it would be a good idea to re-educate them with a different set of tasks is the one you can see here. There are distension patterns that are usually associated with retroversion of the, of the hip. And we create tasks 
which we'll see later, which is the time under tension. So in this these profile of situations, the athlete needs to have a, a, a significant control and also a lot of mobility. So the hip needs to be a mobile area and the central area needs to be stable. And so we need to say to the athlete, look, cr do tasks like this one. Like in the photo in the video, if you can work with just one support, we also have control through the, the posterior tibia. And so we then can re-educate the, the brain to, to work one gluteus with the, the psoas in this manner. Now, regarding the current interventions uh, now underway, well, the, there are our researchers have various ways of uh, working in high performance. And there's initial stimulus on this uh, injured area. And you can see the ultrasounds when we use invasive uh, physiotherapy with a, with, a, with a needle and with electrolysis. And then from there, the what we do combines, as you can see in this picture here, on the one hand, you've got this invasive physiotherapy with a reconditioning program. Now, this only makes sense if you understand the importance of early intervention on the injured tissue. Now, um, Yervin and collaborators showed how important it is to have an early intervention to be able to protect this structure and to uh, generate uh, strength. And so we start very early with these sorts of interventions. I want to show now are the results of the of a grade two rectus femoris injury during three uh, seasons. And this is something that's been currently being reviewed. Here you see a study with 13 subjects who are injured and uh, with a grade two rectus femoris injury. And they're able to perform these tasks so they're able to return to train in 15 days. And we can see there are cases of 27, 20, 20, 25 days, 23 days, 24, and where they go to the second competition. And now we have uh, results of uh, athletes who over 22 days did two competitions after having been uh, getting a, a grade two injury. This uh, study, which I'm talking about here, has been done with a combination of uh, in of electrolysis and a reconditioning program as well. And so the combination of these uh, these two techniques, these two interventions, is what makes up the uh, methodology. This is something we're reviewing and something we're going to uh, um, publish soon. Now I'd like to talk about the progression right up to reconditioning and the future return to training, return to performance. So with this, uh, with this uh, original stimulus, as I just explained, we have a second stimulus to exercise, which we call middle electrolysis. <clears throat> and that's why I'm saying it's, uh, it's an early stimulus, which is done through exercise. And from that point of view, the progression takes us into a uh, indoor rehab program, five to seven days post PNE, with various different uh, tasks, which uh, we'll see in the, over the next slides, until we get to what we call the on-field reconditioning. And there, there are certain more specific tasks, more similar to what the football player needs specifically. So is that with this, the, that allows this return to training or return to sport, which is the same concept that we saw in, um, in other collaborators. So now I'd like 
to talk about the uh, so-called indoor phase, which is made up of two phases on the left-hand side of the slide. You can see the first on a daily basis, 24 hours after the needle stimulation we intervene, and then 48 hours after, 72 hours after, 96 hours after, with a progression criterion, of course. And we come up with the tasks that these three subjects that I just showed need uh, to do day after day so this is what happens with rectus femoris uh, injuries uh, high performance it's uh, scheduled day after day this of course requires also a full type of reconditioning that we later do in our reconditioning lab but before we do that uh, we work on uh, uh, lunge positions isometric work we also do um, synergist muscle activation overactivated muscle inhibition with pressure training foam rollers We basically allow our athletes to progress until they're able to perform the scissor motion that to us is so important in measuring progression after such an injury. Within this indoor phase, there is a first phase, as I said, which is Roman strength, and there's a second phase which starts uh, between the fifth and seventh day after the PNE, and we call that development of movement skills. Um, in this phase, We have our athlete work on his running performance, uh, strength absor uh, absorption. Um, they do some plyometric work as well. Uh, they basically go back to running. That's what it means. We work on their movement skills. Um, as you can see on screen, we have an actual return to running phase. Uh, and that's something that happens in the indoor um, phase as well. So we know with uh, absolute virtual, absolute certainty that this set of tasks will get them to go back to uh, running as soon as possible. We divide this indoor phase in two phases um, because it's very important. And uh, let's have a look at a few of these uh, at a few of these tasks that we have the athlete you know, perform after a rectus femoris injury uh, in high performance. Some of these tasks uh, are centered on scissor motion, uh, triple tension pushes. Uh, we try generating acceleration patterns. Uh, so we recreate all of these uh, situations. And uh, as we evaluate the performance of the athlete, we uh, come up with new tasks to work on the injured rectus femoris. We talked about the sprinting injury mechanism earlier, the mechanics of this uh, injury. And we talked about the swing phase where the rectus femoris is bent at about 20, 25 degrees. That's the uh, phase in which most injuries occur. That's something we're aware of. And as a result, we use tasks that are aimed at protecting the muscle when it performs that motion. This study was done in 2019, and a set of different authors talked about uh, eccentric quasi-isometric work, TUT, ROM, and speed. Uh, they talk about tasks that involve a deceleration phase for the right uh, rectus femoris in this case, which is bent in this um, picture. It's an unstable uh, situation, uh, as you can imagine as the athlete is performing the movement on uh, on a bench. 
and this study we often take into account because uh, it exemplifies a number of important concepts. Time under pressure is one of them, for example. Uh, they talk about eccentric quasi-isometric movements. They talk about uh, the generation of analgesia. Um, they encompass a number of different concepts that are very important in recuperating, recovering after uh, erectus femoris injury in a productive manner. I'd, I'd also like to show you some of the work that was done by my collaborators on the improvement ratio absorption and production strength, which has to do with plane change, pushes, uh, moving across uh, planes where the sartorial muscle is involved as well as the rectus femoris. Um, mo complex movements, um, we could argue, that lead to better hip mobility and better leg mobility. So as you can see, we come up with tasks where um, coordination Intramuscular coordination plays a pivotal uh, role. It's uh, a multifaceted approach. So during the indoor phase, once again, these tasks aim to protect the rectus femoris. And then we have an on-field phase. That's the third phase that begins about nine to 10 days after the PNE, and there are several several blocks here. We do uh, RSAs, sport specific movements, uh, linear and curve sprints, uphill sub maximal sprints, a number of different tasks that are more closely related uh, to the movements the athletes actually perform on the field. So deceleration patterns and closed skills, dynamic patterns that entail a high degree of effort repetition with coordination drills and closed and open skills. We actually progress, we move from closed to open skills, which is something a number of authors have already talked about and looked at. Um, we also have our different tasks with uh, working on triple extension, uphill submaximal sprint, because we want to recuperate these extension patterns that are so, so important. In this study, which is currently being reviewed, we talk about different GPS parameters. So we look at different parameters at different uh, speeds. So we provide an interpretation of the statistical analysis that shows that there is no significant difference pre and post injury, which is good. It means the athletes are recovering properly. And it shows that this methodology that is proposed for recovering from uh, rectus femoris injuries is backed by data and it actually gets our athletes to return to training and playing. Also, as I said earlier, there are about four or five players who after 23, 24, 25 days after the injury, they're able to go back to competition. So in the fourth um, section of this presentation, and it seems like I'm running out of time, so I'll be uh, as quick as possible. I'd like to talk to you about some um, techniques that we use to evaluate load control uh, before returning to training or competition. This is, this is of course, after uh, rectus femoris uh, injury. So there is an evaluation phase, an indoor phase, and on the seventh day, and that's portrayed on screen in uh, orange, we have different blocks. Um, it's the readaptation phase. On the 10th day, we have our player return to training. And uh, return to play on the 16th day. So there are different variables, different parameters here that we have to work with. 
on the first day. Uh, volume is between 30 and 45 minutes. But we don't cover a lot of distance. Uh, never cover more than 18 meters in terms of distance. That's the uh, gray uh, block that you can see on screen. Um, so it's quality work as opposed to quantity work at first. So that's the first phase. Around the fourth field day, so that's the 10th day since the injury, we introduce more GPS parameters on the external load. Um, And we record the performance of the player. Um, if the player is uh, able to run faster than 18 kilometers an hour, HSR amounts generally to about 529. But we don't know if those values are high or low for that particular player. We just record them. Uh, all we're interested in is returning our player to play because that's what the coach wants on the 13th day since the injury, we go back to training, but with a number of modifications to the uh, training plan, to the training program, uh, we won't be disclosing the names of the players we've worked with, but uh, from what you can see on the screen, uh, the data clearly shows that on the 13th day, our players are perfectly able to adapt to the new training load regarding the number of accelerations and decelerations. On the 15th day from the injury, MD minus one, we can appreciate that the player is going back to the minimum requirements of group training. And then in this slide, we're showing you data regarding return to play. What we analyze is uh, speed and uh, uh, meters, a uh, distance covered. You can clearly see that uh, in this particular case, the player has not only returned to a similar level to his uh, pre-injury level, he's also uh, faster than he was before, uh, running 528 meters on the first day. Um, and in competition, this player was the second best players in terms of distance covered. So a great return to to, uh, to the pitch, a great return to competition for this player. Also, we have some more data regarding uh, the match, the return match, apart from those 90 minutes, which the player did play, this is the return to performance, mind you. So it's not returning just for the sake of returning, it's you know returning and be able to perform to a high standard, which the player did, as you were able to see. So some take home messages to conclude this presentation. First off, Early stimulation through exercise is key to facilitating uh, regeneration, reparation of injured muscle and the reestablishment of neuromuscular function. Second message, this uh, reconditioning program should be based on functional progression and performance criteria. It should not be based on criteria that have to do with time. Thirdly, return to play, early return to play is possible if the injured muscle has optimal tolerance and tension in the early stages. And then uh, to conclude uh, further reflection, science is important. But what's more important is enabling injured athletes to go back to training. And uh, to play, which is more complex. That was all really. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. However, I do have to attend to um, a training session with Getaf and I'll have to leave soon, but I do have about eight, 10 minutes to answer your questions. Thank you, Sergio. We've got a couple of questions. Angel, Ortipio Morillas asks, to evaluate the different joints affected and the mechanical repercussions uh, of uh, 
the athletic uh, gesture in physiotherapy, right? Regarding physiotherapy, I, or, I only talked about image uh, evaluation, uh, so to speak. Uh, but in clubs nowadays, there are experts who only work in this area. There are more and more professionals than ever before within the medical staff whom, who are able to make this evaluation that you're talking about. Um, these examinations, these evaluations are complementary in nature, but they're useful. In terms of arthrocinematic, for example, that's an interesting evaluation. And an image evaluation of uh, tissue health is also important. So those are things we try doing, but they're also rather complex. But yes, there are tools that we know and that we take into account when it comes to uh, treating our athlete. Thank you, Sergio. I wish we had more time to talk with you, but I know you're in a hurry, so we'll let you go. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your excellent work. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Dear students, we'll be back in a couple of minutes with our next uh, speakers. We'll be talking to Dr. Jose Nieta. See you in a couple of minutes. Thank you. 
Good evening. Let's uh, carry on. We'll now be talking to Dr. To Dr. Nieta, physiotherapist, works with uh, such athletes as Mario Mola and other triathlon athletes, world-class triathlon athletes. He's also director of uh, physiotherapy for uh, uh, the Spanish Triathlon Federation. Thank you very much, Germán. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, the Real Madrid University School for um, inviting me to take part in this symposium. Um, I've actually learned a lot here already, and I look forward to hearing uh, the other speakers as well. So thank you very much for inviting me to take part in it. Triathlon is an endurance sport. It's a very different sport, uh, a very different instance to what Sergio was talking about in terms of reconditioning and readaptation. It's a holistic, multifaceted concept. Uh, and it's a completely different sport uh, with a cyclical uh, component. Now I'd like to talk a bit about my professional experience in this uh, in the, this group with these athletes, and specifically to talk about some of the um, injuries that occur. I'm going to talk a bit about some stress uh, fractures that we've seen in our group, and which uh, unfortunately have continued to grow in uh, resistance uh, sports, and in including in the, the triathlon. Now, stress fracture is a, a continuity solution which occurs in the bone because of repetitive strain uh, which at some point overcomes uh, resistance of the bone. The bone is a living tissue which has been constantly renewed. About 10% of the bone tissue is replaced every year and between destruction and construction of the bone, we create a significant consistency in the bones. It's important that this always takes place in a balanced way. And it says with this stimulus on the bone that we manage to get a more resistant bone structure. Problems occur when these two processes of reabsorption and formation are imbalanced. In this case, we see more destruction of the bone compared to formation. Now, the osteoblasts, which destroy and reabsorb part of this bone, become dominant, predominate over the formation, or which is created by the osteoclasts. This happens through the repetitive strain, with repetitive burden, and so that it creates a window of weakness in certain points of the bone. And through this repetitive uh, actions, this strain, what was micro traumas end up becoming genuine bone fractures. Now, the most uh, common definitions uh, we have uh, excessive uh, load on a healthy bone. This was first defined in military uh, contexts. At the end of the 19th century, they started to describe this. Right from the beginning, they uh, they made them, the, the soldiers do long walks with all of their heavy backpacks. And soon they, they noticed that there was this excess load And uh, it was in the 50s that they started to describe it as well in the sporting context. And people also who don't practice sport. This occurs in professional sport and in amateur sport. Because we see that there's an increase uh, in running nowadays. So 
a lot of people who never went running before, who are not used to impact sports, are suddenly going out running, running like soldiers. They go directly to the, uh, as if they're going straight to war. And, uh, and some people are losing respect for distance, and there are people who without any kind of preparation, without sort of uh, uh, athletic pass in a very short period of time, without going through the right progression, they just suddenly, it's like a, soldiers who just start by going to war, and so this is very dangerous, and that uh, explains the increased uh, number of uh, um, stress fractures in amateur sport. But of course, we also put in professional sport. Because of a bone insufficiency, we have um, armless loads, and they can be fatigue because of bone insufficiency. And here, this is probably because of an underlying bone problem such as osteoporosis, and this. Uh, and this and the, the fracture in the bone because they already have a weak structure and they have low density. Then there's the third classification. Uh, female athlete, alongside a weakened bone, means that uh, that the, the bone can be weakened and then the, and in professional sport they can create a lot of strain we can get to a vicious circle and it's quite a complex vicious circle and and there's something that needs to be sorted out according to the uh, risk factors in each uh, in the general different uh, disciplines so there's a uh, swimming running and cycling high number of injuries and almost all of them when they do occur are, are related to the uh, the area of the the shoulder All stress factors impact. They can be uh, exerting more up to three times our body weight. All of the stress fractures are as Mm, 
de vidas a la, a la carrera a pie. Sí. Entre los factores de riesgo, pues bueno, tenemos, podemos clasificarlos entre intrínsecos y extrínsecos. Dentro de los factores intrínsecos podemos hablar, en primer lugar, que las mujeres tienen un riesgo tres veces superior al de los hombres eh, de, de <coughs> sufrir estas facturas por estrés. Y esto puede ser debido a muchos de los otros factores que vienen a continuación. En primer lugar, hay una predisposición esquelética. Either because of the mineral density in the bone or because of the diameter of these bone structures. Having a low uh, diameter and having a, a, a weak mineral structure increases the risk of uh, stress factors. Another interesting factors are hormonal factors. We've seen this very often. And we've had uh, athletes We've had problems with the menstrual cycles, uh, menorrhea, dysmenorrhea, and quite a, even cases of girls who, or women who uh, haven't had menstrual cycle for, for years. And so that, and that can lead to other uh, problems. And perhaps the most important factor uh, is a poor eating habits. Energy deficits are perhaps the is the specific way of saying it, but this is a key and it is a very important factor. Now, these mineral density, um, problems in the menstrual cycle, and uh, poor eating, or have not enough energy reserves, these are really the triad of the athlete. These factors can be modified, but a lot of them certain types of We're trying to move away from models in certain countries in which they prioritize, for example, very intense training sessions, like running in while fasting um, with very low calorie levels doesn't provide any and it could models we have to leave the hip one hip size being and also the fact of having had previous uh, fractures So any kind of you can see how they act the, 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 the dynamics of the group and uh, and to monitor things very closely because it's very important especially with people we've just started working with now apart from these intrinsic factors there are also extrinsic factors which I think are the key to stress factor. That's why we have to be trying to be preventive. There's going to also be poor running tech. In the athletic school, the triathlon school, they do work on Sometimes 
determinado momento, para volver a la normalidad eh, individual de cada uno. Es decir, que hay ciertas técnicas de carreras, todos conocemos a diferentes atletas de, <coughs> bueno, de, de larga distancia, como Pablo Agassi, que eh, también eh, atletas asiáticos que corren athletes muy pegados al cuerpo, desde luego no son who run with their uh, arms next to their, their bodies, and these are techniques that uh, Uh, are very common and, um, and these are things that they're um, very used to doing and with it, changing these patterns is very, very difficult and perhaps it's not because we have to take into account but it's something that we need to look at in the early stages uh, when the, the people are very young and uh, having the right material is also very important but of course the work, the group that we're in uh, now it's true that uh, We might have this problem. Hands often send the new shoes and the they send things too late. That's not the most important problem because they have a, a lot of different uh, options and they and they know what sort of uh, shoes we need to work with and how often they need to be changed. Type of terrain is also very important. For example, working on new terrain can be risky. That's one of the things we uh, monitor. And in those instances uh, where uh, uh, athletes train on inadequate terrain, it was because there had been a last minute change. And those are things that often uh, led uh, to reoccurrences. Uh, also, uh, as far as extrinsic factors go, we have the diet and inadequate uh, diet can lead to problems. And finally, there is another factor. It's social media, uh, which is an increasingly important factor, unfortunately. And um, in this day and age, everything you do is posted on uh, social media, is available on the internet. And this is affecting professional amateur athletes, perhaps Um, amateur athletes even more so than professional athletes. Each time you train, you post your training session to the web. Impossible training sessions, ridiculously intense. And some amateur um, professionals, amateur um, athletes try to emulate their idols, but they just can't. You can't just emulate a professional triathlon athlete um, triathlon athletes uh, never say, you know, yeah, I've just done this uh, super intense training session, but uh, I've eaten well, I slept 10 hours straight, and I'm going to have a half hour nap afterwards. They don't say that on social media. Amateur athletes don't know that, and they try emulating them, and that's Uh, that's very bad. They try emulating these professionals who are very, very talented. They work in much better conditions. So amateur athletes, due to social media, are at a higher implicit risk. But there are also risks for professional athletes because, uh, uh, for example, very often when I was faced with uh, uh, eating disorders in professional athletes, those stemmed from... Uh, fixations they they had acquired on social uh, media i've worked with female athletes who wanted to lose weight precisely because on social media they were exposed to this image of women that was irrealistic uh, triathletes train very very intensely they need an adequate diet to sustain themselves on and uh, social media unfortunately have this power sometimes over them and of course they have some advantages social media but uh, they have some disadvantages as well and that's something we have to take into account and that should be added in my opinion to the extrinsic uh, factors so once this stress fracture has been uh, suffered unfortunately we move on to the to the uh, diagnosis phase at the clinic so an athlete shows up a young athlete with localized pain, pain, inflammation, which um, coupled with uh, um, a clinical history of previous fractures, well, we th immediately think of uh, stress fractures. Uh, so at first, uh, you need to keep calm and wait a couple of days and see what happens because uh, 
Sometimes, you know, the progression of these uh, injuries can surprise you positively. Um, after some rest, not a lot of rest, but if you wait a couple of days after suffering one of these injuries, you're still not feeling right. Well, you usually get an MRI. Sometimes MRIs don't actually uh, show the fracture because they're very localized fracture and they're invisible uh, until weeks after it's been suffered. That happens. Um, If on an MRI you see a little white stain, well, that's showing you that, uh, yes, the athlete has suffered a stress fracture, but that's an old one. Anyway, uh, we also use gamographies, which uh, are able to help a little better. In this case, what you can see in the red circle is a buildup of um, radioisotopes. So through gamography, we are able to identify and localize the injury. And uh, but MRIs, as I said earlier, can also help. Anyway, uh, x-rays, uh, MRIs, uh, gamography, uh, no matter what we choose, we wait a bit and we see how the athlete, um, how the situation progresses in the first couple of days. Studies have shown that uh, uh, throughout a season, throughout a year, uh, triathletes uh, would repeatedly undergo MRIs, and those who'd experienced uh, symptoms of a stress fracture were as numerous as those who'd had uh, similar symptoms, meaning that basically stress fractures can be difficult uh, to diagnose. Um, the same thing happens, for example, with um, a herniated disc. I am assuming that quite a lot of us must have suffered a herniated disc, but we simply don't know that because uh, we never got diagnosed with it. So once again, the most important thing is at first, you see how the situation progresses because the image can show you a stress fracture, a recovering stress fracture. And if that happens, the triathlete is going to stay away from training for a long time, perhaps even for too long. I'm not saying that these fractures should be underestimated. Uh, you obviously have to uh, respect and abide by recovery times. But at the same time, this injury goes through different phases. And the timing uh, of our intervention must be calculated around the symptoms that the athlete experiences. So what I'm trying to say is whatever the image shows uh, is something you uh, have to consider cautiously, with caution. And the vast majority of our triathletes in any given season, even if they haven't um, suffered an actual fracture, they must have had at least uh, a stress reaction. They must have suffered a stress reaction that gave similar symptoms. And during the reabsorption reabsor bone formation process, an MRI might have given a similar result, even if they didn't suffer any stress fractures. So. That's why we want to wait in the early stages. If a triathlete decides, some triathletes have decided um, not getting the scan and the pain went away after three days. Other athletes got the scan and the pain also went away after three days. So it all depends really. You need to talk with physicians and physiotherapists. Um, actually, we often talk to physiotherapists um, first because we train uh, in different uh, parts of the world uh, in uh, you know at a high temperature low temperature uh, depending where the competition is and um, it means that unfortunately uh, physicians can't always uh, uh, follow us on tour this is a minority sport after all so um, 
we have limited resources and because these physicians can't necessarily come on tour with us uh, we work primarily with uh, physiotherapists but also because we don't have any physicians with us these images these scans can also be difficult to interpret now regarding treatment uh, there is less of a doubt here treatment for stress fractures is basically aimed at dealing with the factors that caused the very stress fracture to occur. So what we can do is an actually aimed at uh, curing the symptoms of the stress fracture. It's aimed at preventing further fractures from ever happening. So the first thing we do is active rest for about six to eight weeks after uh, the fracture has been suffered. Uh, so triathletes keep on training, but you know, um, in a different way. Um, they can generally keep on uh, uh, training uh, on bikes. Uh, they can perform relatively normally unless they have to stand on the pedals, but um, no limitations there. There are some limitations in the pool if you can't push off of the wall, uh, but that's um, not a big limitation. But anyway, uh, they still keep, a tra keep keep on training, but they have a different schedule, a different training plan. We also do some manual therapy and electrotherapy, which generally uh, helps uh, shock waves and uh, magnet therapy. But we don't use it too much, I have to say. After about seven days without any pain, we go back to running. We often start off with aqua running. So athletes run in the pool, water by the shoulders. So they reenact uh, the athletic the athletic gesture that, would, that they would be performing whilst running on a field. Um, we try. Uh, doing some interval training in aqua um, uh, running in order to properly manage intensity. And then we use, we use Alter G as well. They're particular treadmills with a pneumatic um, balloon uh, at the bottom. And the more it's inflated, the uh, more weight is discharged off of the runner's legs. It's basically like running on the moon at some point, and it has shown benefits uh, whilst recovering from a from from an injury so regarding the reproduction of this athletic gesture uh, the alter g treadmill is very very useful before an athlete goes back to running on field um, we start off on a 50 60 percent uh, uh, body mass load and then we slowly progress to 90 percent body mass um, uh, load which is very close to running outdoors on the field. So we work with intensity, volume, and frequency. Those are the only factors we can work with. Uh, this progressive recovery program, uh, which eventually leads to going back to running on the field, lasts for about four weeks. In the first week, the athlete runs for about five to 10 minutes, but um, alternately. So the athlete runs on one day, the following day they rest, the following day they run again. So alternating rest days with training days. Um, and they keep on going. We also alternate between running and walking progressively modifying the ratio. The second uh, week, they can run up to 20 minutes, but it's still fraction training. They would train, uh, you know, five to 10 minutes uh, with intervals at the beginning of the week, and they would end on the 20 minute session at the end of the week. On the third week, they go back to continuous running and they 
uh, well, and we increase intensity. So athletes at this point start uh, running several days in a row, uh, 20 minutes the first day, for example, 25 on the second, then on the third day, they go back to 20 minutes and so on and so forth. After four to five weeks, they can go back to uh, a regular uh, training regime. So that's what treatment is. At the same time, of course, the diet is also affected. Um, it has to be rich in vitamin D and calcium. Hormonal treatment can sometimes be necessary, as can psychological assistance. Uh, generally speaking, it's difficult for an athlete to suffer an injury, and uh, sometimes they need psychological assistance. Sometimes the injury will keep them off tr of training f and off competition for months even. Uh, in the case, for example, of a serious injury. Um, and if it happens at a key moment during the season, well, all of the work that's been done prior to that moment goes to waste. So uh, uh, physiotherapists, of course, aren't psychologists. They can offer some help mentally speaking, but they're not psychologists, you know? Uh, so they have to be aware of this and they have to be careful what they tell their athletes when they start working with them, especially in early stages of an injury. So what you should do is uh, speak to the coach first, communicate with your athlete, but be careful what you say. Be careful what you say because uh, we often talk about the positive psychological impacts of working with a physiotherapist, but at the same time, psychologists can also have uh, unwillingly perhaps a negative impact on uh, uh, the psychological state of their athletes. So it's important that they keep calm and that uh, they make, decision, make their decisions alongside the uh, coach. We're all working towards the same goal, and uh, it's important that we coordinate in uh, key moments. So this is a list of studies that I touched upon uh, earlier. Um, vitamin D and calcium can reduce the occurrence of stress fractures by up to 20% in women uh, that in the military, but in women in the military, that's what the study found. So that helps. Prevention, preventive treatment is also very important. The vast majority of stress fractures can be avoided, especially if you've already suffered one as an athlete. If I've already had a stress uh, fracture as an athlete, as a triathlete, if that happens again, in my opinion, that's on the physiotherapist. It's it's a failure uh, to me uh, because it could have been avoided. Um, it's a failure for the athlete, for the coach, and for the physiotherapist. Some of the blame can be placed on the athlete because, well, athletes need to be adept at communicating with their uh, staff. Sometimes triathletes don't want to stop. They want to talk. They don't want to talk about the problems they have because they think it will just go away if they just keep training. They don't want to stop, basically. And um, they're afraid that if something has happened to them, it might be something serious. And as a result, they don't talk about it with their staff. Sometimes that happens because they're under a lot of pressure from their family, from the uh, federation, because they're under financial pressure even in high performance um, sports and in minority sports, especially, uh, you know, the financial situation of athletes isn't always uh, peachy, so to speak. And uh, if they can't compete, they lose sponsors, they lose money. And uh, that adds to the pressure. And so sometimes they prefer not to report an injury. And we find out that they've been struggling with pain for three weeks all of a sudden. Sometimes 
Another factor we have to take into consideration is competition. Competition not only with uh, uh, foreign athletes, so with other national teams, but also internal competition within one's national team. Um, in competition, you're competing because it's a competition, but if you're also competing in training because you want to be above everyone else, well, that's a problem. If, uh, as an athlete, you approach each and every training session as a competition, you're a lot more likely to suffer injuries. And that often happens due to the lack of confidence in uh, one's own performance. Athletes often think that they haven't been training hard enough or often enough. That leads to um, a lack of uh, confidence in themselves and in their training plan as well. Very often, when uh, when when a new athlete joins our group they they think that they haven't been training hard enough a new athletes say i've been training a lot less than i used to before and they think they they're not doing enough they lose confidence in themselves they lose confidence in their method And this can lead to communication issues uh, whereby athletes don't report injuries, they want to train more. So the coach plays a key role in this regard in order to prevent these issues from ever arising. Communication is both verbal and non-verbal. We're often obsessed with monetizing with what we what we read on reports and we forget about the importance of our day-to-day -day lives our communication with our athletes and that's something of course that you learn a lot more about um, with experience an experienced coach knows when an athlete is ready to achieve optimal performance also, very often, athletes work closely, sorry, coaches work closely with uh, uh, federations. And sometimes federation, federations can put pressure on these coaches, which in turn transfer the pressure on the athletes. Athletes have to participate in minor competition. Their schedule becomes very tight and they're under a lot more pressure Through uh, communication and experience, a coach is able to always be there uh, for their athletes. And another important aspect is customization, um, individualizing your athletes, being able to talk to them, being able to understand what's going on with them, being able to bear in mind at all times what their uh, current profile is. Being able basically to constantly monitor a coach's team is key to uh, for the purpose of uh, team management in uh, coaches. If as a coach you see that uh, your athlete isn't telling you something, then talk to them. They're being reckless for whatever reason and you need to help them. If as a coach you're able to adjust the workload to information like this, then great. And as regards physiotherapists, it's important, of course, to communicate with them, to communicate with the coach and uh, to adjust the pressure you put them under, pressure to go back to competing that comes both from the coach and from the triathlete pressure to return to competition we're under a lot of pressure for that reason and if you if, if we know there's a competition coming up sometimes coaches and triathletes will tell you okay let's speed it up we want to go back to the competition we have to avoid that um through experience, 
We're also able uh, to better calibrate our communication skills. I remember once uh, talking to an athlete that uh, claimed to have been fine up to that point. I uh, checked him, I gave him a checkup on the stretcher and I realized he was basically unfit to, uh, 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 to compete. On top of that, the athlete felt he wasn't ready uh, to compete because his biking skills weren't up to notch, uh, up to standard. So communication skills for physiotherapists are also very, uh, very, very important. Uh, your athletes need rest days. On rest days, they do gym, they uh, work in the pool and They work um, at the gym, as I said earlier, uh, but that's all they have to do. They can't do, they shouldn't do too much. They have to rest. So this is our uh, work model. And if we want to prevent injuries, especially stress fractures from ever happening again, well, communication first off is key communication that is based on uh, experience, communication that is ever-flowing amongst these three pillars, athlete, physiotherapist, and coach, and that's fundamental in all sports, but especially in high-performance triathlon. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayota. Unfortunately, I think we're running short on time. So we're going to go uh, on a break very, very shortly, and we'll come back on at 10 to uh, 6. We'll uh, make sure uh, to uh, ask Dr. Miota your questions if uh, we get the opportunity to do so. Uh, thank you very much.
Testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three, testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three, testing, can you hear me? One, two, three, one, two, three, testing, testing. Testing, testing, one, two, three, one. Ready? What? Oh, do you want to go and get... Muy buenas tardes de nuevo. Eh, a continuación tenemos el, la suerte y el placer de contar con el doctor Jordan Santos. Eh, el doctor Jordan Santos es profesor Santos. de la Universidad de University of the Basque Country, un experto en sports performance, y hoy va a estar hablando con nosotros sobre dos maratones. Over to you. Thank you very much. So today I'll be talking to you about two marathons, or rather, well, uh, marathons that run under two hours. And before that, I'll be talking about the physiological aspects of training that are necessary uh, to achieve this challenge. But I'd also, I'd also like to talk about the um, historic importance of uh, this athletic feat. So 
I think the most similar achievement in the world of sports was uh, the four minute mile, uh, which it would almost be the equivalent to uh, the current two hour marathon that we've been attempting to break because it challenges uh, uh, the limits of uh, um, of our body, basically. People thought it was impossible. Um, so let's talk about the uh, history of it for a little bit. In 1954, the world record was four minutes, one second, and people thought that it was impossible um, to break the, that record. One of the best athletes around at that point was John Landy, an Australian athlete. And after a few unsuccessful attempts, to uh, break the record, stated that to him it felt like taking down a brick wall with his bare hands and that he wouldn't try uh, breaking that record ever again. He tumbled, he gave up, he said, I will never attempt this ever again. However, the athlete, the athlete who's uh, portrayed in this picture, Roger Bannister, was able to break this record in three minutes, 59 seconds. and. Interestingly, John Landy, uh, six weeks later, was able to further break that record, running the mile in three minutes, 58 seconds. So this shows, I think, that there was a mental barrier here. Roger Bannister broke that barrier, took it down. And John Landy, a few weeks back, was able to further um, break the record. I'm sorry, uh, there was some feedback. So um, this two hour barrier in marathons could also be a psychological barrier. After all, several studies have uh, uh, shown that it is. It is a mental uh, obstacle. However, unlike uh, the four minute mile, there are other factors in this particular case that we should take into account. The four minute barrier wasn't only uh, mental, it was also physiological. The, act, the current world record is three minutes, 43 seconds. I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, I would like to ask all other participants to switch off their microphones, please. So the current world record is three minutes, 43 seconds. However, when Landy broke this record, he was actually fighting against the clock. Roger Bannister wasn't. There was a, a factor, another factor, John Landy attempting to break the record in Australia, where the tracks weren't as good as they are in Europe. Modern tracks are 1.5% faster than old tracks. So if we apply all these correction factors, it becomes apparent that this challenge is, of course, a, a mental uh, issue, a mental barrier, but it's also determined by other factors, physical factors. We'll also be talking so today about strategies and that has allowed them to break the barrier of uh, two hours. For example, one key factor the two-hour uh, uh, barrier Second World War, and that meant that there was a fight in the war. Uh, athletics wasn't a priority. That's something you have to take into account. 
So we need athletes with a certain capacity to beat a record. The World War meant that this had to wait for almost a decade. And it was at Santorini who was able to do it. In the case of the marathon, we have the white population. There was the many from the Horn of Africa, such as Ethiopia. And uh, in the last 20 years above all, but pretty much since 1990, the Kenyans have uh, really uh, taken this up, taken the reins. So we are, to know whether this is possible, we have to look at two factors. First of all, there's the current situation. What, what is the record now? Well, now it's the, it's uh, Elud Kipchoge, who has the record in uh, two hours, one minute and 39 seconds. That was in the Berlin Marathon in, uh, in 2018. Now, this was an improvement compared to the previous one of one minute, 18 seconds, which is the best improvement in 60 years. So it was a huge uh, quality uh, jump. Because if we compare with the, the previous improvements, 15 years earlier, there'd been a, a, an improvement of, of about two minutes. But now the current situation is that we're right, we're very close. The two hour barrier is about to be broken. And to think whether or not it's possible, whether we're one, two, three years away. Well, there are various different models to predict when this barrier will be broken. Now, how can we predict when this, this will first uh, happen in standard conditions? Because it happened in non-official conditions. Well, there are mathematical models. Or we can look at physiological models. As so we look at physiological parameters to predict uh, performance. We tend to use maximum oxygen consumption and various different thresholds as possible indicators to predict performance. Now, for example, if we look at mathematical models, we see that until about 2000, the curve of progression of records, which you see in blue turquoise, well, the records were quite few until the Kenyans, the great athletes, especially the Preselassi uh, uh, generation, we see how the trend changed. There's a new population here who are very good at this. And so the records are improving. The Kenyans came along, it was used to be two hours, six minutes, and. Uh, and now uh, we're seeing improvements quite quickly. And the records are more frequent. And according to the, the first line of progression, we thought that the, the, the two hours would be, we thought it, it could be from between 2020 to 2030. But, in, but since 2016, there's been a new revolution, in this case due to technology. And it seems that the records could come much sooner than those models uh, are stating. From a physiological point of view, the first uh, physiological model that was proposed uh, by Michael Joyner in nearly 30 years ago in 1991, and he said that what there was the hypothetical limit for a human being has been one hour, 57 minutes and 58 seconds. And we have to understand the context in which this prediction was made in 1991, the record was very far from here. Now we don't find it so unthinkable, but when he made this prediction, it was quite a, a risky uh, affirmation, but it took into account the best values for oxygen consumption, percentage of, of oxygen that could be sustained during a marathon, and uh, various values. And so with these uh, parameters, we combine them and so we can put, approximately predict uh, what the, uh, the athlete can do. So here's some basic things here. 
So if you've got a, a hypothetical athlete with a maximum oxygen consumption of 75 milliliters per kilo per minute, which is what a lot of elite athletes also in Spain can, uh, can, can achieve, and, uh, and then 171 milliliters per kilometer, kilo per kilometer, which is uh, a lot of African uh, athletes have similar values. If they could maintain an 80% of uh, over two hours, then we, they could run another two hours. So this is, this is a physiology, which is plausible, where and, uh, they could run another two hours. Now we could have slightly uh, higher uh, maximum oxygen, but uh, better RE, then uh, there's also another possibility of an, another hypo hypothesis. With values are slightly worse than, than running economy, but with a better maximum consumption of oxygen. Now these, these are not implausible, these values, they do exist. And the fact there's an Eritrean uh, athlete who's got 80 and uh, and in fact, in the European uh, University of Madrid, he was there 15 years ago. And he beat the world record for the half marathon. Now, physiologically, he was someone you would imagine to be able to run in two hours, although he never actually achieved this. He never managed to run in two hours, two minutes, two hours, three minutes because as this philosophy, physiology predicted. Now, physiology is very important, but there's also a limiting factor. There are other factors other than physiology in uh, a marathon. And the simplest thing would be to look at the other official and non-official uh, records that have occurred in recent years to try and see what the factors are in order to be able to achieve uh, this uh, breaking this barrier of, of uh, two hours in a standardized marathon. Now we know that in standardized marathons, uh, now this story of non-official uh, attempts have been recent. The first non-official attempt was, uh, of, was the sub two hours marathon by Yanis Pitsiladis. And he, wanted to do it in a standardized marathon, but he came up with various interesting strategies. For example, the technology, this was a, but there was a, the, the funds that they needed to bring this ahead uh, made it very difficult. So, uh, this project was then equipped by the Breaking to Nike. And Nike had three important athletes. And they were very close to breaking the two-hour barrier. But this was really an attempt to see that the two hours were, were possible. There was also Adidas that had a project. The Adidas sub two hours. They didn't... Uh, work out. The dark athlete was a Kenyan who beat the world record, but it uh, didn't work out in the end. And then finally, there was the Ineos challenge, where they, he did actually break the two-hour barrier. Now, we can learn certain things from these previous attempts to see what it is that we need to do to break the two-hour barrier in a standardized marathon. So the breaking two, well, what, what did it teach us? Well, this was done by Nike, and this was done in the Formula One uh, circuit. So they run around, run around that, which is uh, one and a half miles long. And it's a circuit that has certain advantages. One of the main advantages is that it's almost completely flat. There's very little up and down. And from a, a strictly regulatory point of view, it's, uh, it is something that could be standardized for a marathon because the distance between the, is less than 21 kilometers between the starting point and the end point. So from that point of view, the circuit could be a standardized circuit, but they use certain strategies that may mean that it can't be uh, standardized. Now, one of the most important strategies is the pacing, 
they use teams, three different teams of, of 18 that uh, pairs and that they were doing, they had a, a, a training, uh, a diamond training with six runners who were going behind a car, a Tesla car. And so to help them with, uh, to, against wind resistance. And here they had a, they had a sort of a diamond formation that they ran in. And so there were sort of wind tunnels. They thought that was the best strategy to be able to follow this Tesla car, which was marking the, the pace. And they showed that, that this was created a, a wind tunnel and there were various tunnels that show that uh, that this did uh, save energy uh, in runners. And part of the strategy that were later used in terms of pacing were learned uh, in this uh, initial attempt of breaking two. It was also interesting. It was uh, hydration. Instead of using the, the strategies of commercial um, marathons, where they, they grab the water and they carry on running, here, they were given it every 2.4 kilometers. They were given it by a, a, a bike. So they didn't need to slow down at all to grab a bottle. So they had it immediately available. Now the night technicians said that that can give improvements of, of up to five seconds in each time they, they drink. So that can be about 30 seconds improvement. And that's uh, something definitely to be taken into account. And then, of course, a very important factor is the equipment use. They use the uh, special technology here. It's made up of a special material, which allows elasticity of, with 85% transmission of energy. They're very light. Independent studies have shown that the, uh, it can lead to an improvement of up to 4%. And various studies have shown that uh, there's a variability between uh, uh, individuals. There's some for whom it's 4%, others less. But it seems that they, these shoes are quite revolutionary. Now, I didn't think that the shoes would be so uh, important in here, but I, I turned out that I was wrong, that these shoes really are a fundamental um, component to this. And then, of course, they had rigid carbon uh, base, which uh, uh, improved the, the elastic transmission of energy. <laughs> so this pacing, this drafting, Um, brought them very close, just 25 se seconds away. And so, and so we saw that it wasn't so impossible. We were quite close. And then there were the next attempt, which was, uh, which was more recent, was successful. This was in Vienna. It wasn't a uh, Formula One circuit. It was done in the city of Vienna, a completely flat circuit with the full turns, but uh, they did it in, in, in large roundabouts. So there wasn't a loss of... Uh, of speed. The fact that it was close to the public meant that the, it was slightly warmer, and that's not ideal physiologically to have an increase in temperature. However, from in terms of motivation, I'm sure that helps a lot to have people egging you on. And, uh, now, that was uh, uh, probably a good idea then. And so, from the pacing point of view, the scheme changed it was different from the nike version instead of it being like an, an arrow shape it was an inverted arrow with two behind so this is diamond formation then it seemed it would be better from an aerodynamic point of view and it turned out to be very successful because the pacing was perfect there was a car in front with the green lights which marked exactly where everyone needed to go and so they're able to maintain the pace in a much more stable way so in terms of pacing and the formation of the hairs uh, this uh, showed that it was very successful <laughs>
and this is perhaps something to be remembered for future races. When athletes want to beat a record, they perhaps could request this sort of formation. In terms of hydration, one key thing is that he trains to consume um, between 60 to 100 grams of carbohydrates uh, per hour. And uh, almost all of them were uh, drinks. This was a And this uh, contained 80 grams of carbohydrates for every half a liter of the liquid. And so that was perhaps a minimum factor, but uh, this is something that does need to be mentioned. Now, there are studies now that suggest that you can consume large quantities of heart carbohydrates and that has certain advantages. Well, this is something that uh, shouldn't be ignored then. And then definitely the most important factor were the shoes. The Nike Alpha Fly, which were a real revolution. They had three rigid carbon layers on top of each other, two high pressure um, um, airbags, and that, that gives a lot of elastic return. This is something that had never been seen before. And these are, it's not available to the public and the wide public. There are no studies that are published, but there was a small committee that. Uh, the studies and even an 8% improvement. That's a considerable improvement. Now, all the controversy arose around this. There's a lot of athletes, athletes. Well, they said that depending on a, on a sort of shoe was so important, they were thinking that uh, the athletics committee had to regulate this and establish new standards to say what si types of shoes are acceptable or not. But currently, they're not legal because the thickness is more than 40 millimeters and they have more than one layer of carbon inside. So these shoes could never be used for a standardized, uh, a standard uh, record because they wouldn't be, uh, they don't meet the rules. Now, there have been attempts to break the two-hour barriers in, in a standardized marathon. So, well, first of all, you need to have the right athlete. Let's keep Jogger, of course. So. But he's now 35, and the next Kenyan athletes who are going to try and beat the record are going to have to try to focus their effort on improving the five pillars that need to be uh, for, for beating the record. Firstly, there's training, of course. And then you've got the circuit and external conditions. Then there's nutrition and hydration, what sort of strategy they should follow. And then there's, of course, the equipment, which is key. So in terms of uh, training, the next slide, this is going to talk about uh, the training of uh, high-level marathon runners. And we can hear from Javier Guerra, who's probably the best Spanish marathon runner in the world now. So, uh, I think he can, Jesus can talk about it better than anyone in the next speech. So we're going to hear about, about hydration and uh, nutrition and circuits. And in terms of equipment, where the limits are and certain aspects and parameters that we have to take into account in a successful athlete who aspires to be able to break this barrier. So on the one hand, we've got the circuit. We've got standardized circuits, where the, the, the last uh, seven records have been in Berlin. And the fastest time, which was outside of Berlin, was in London last year. So if you look at this profile, we see that it's very flat. The average temperature is quite low. And there aren't many turns of more than 90 degrees, which are, are difficult. At any rate, 
for a circuit to be successful, it has to meet certain conditions. First of all, it has to have the ideal profile. Uh, they have to have money, and you have to have the right climate conditions. Because if any one of those things fails, it's very difficult to uh, achieve it. For example, if you look at the New York marathon, the temperature in New York is good, and they have money to get the best athletes. But look at the profile of the New York mar marathon. It's very difficult. There's a lot of ups and downs. It's got a lot of uh, sharp turns, so it's not the ideal circuit. Now, if you take into account those circuits with the right climate and with the right money to get the best athletes and with good profile, and that's why there are very few marathons that uh, bring together the best brands. Now, amongst the best, uh, there are six circuits. So you can see four here, sorry. And where you see less than, uh, it's Berlin, London, Dubai, and Valencia, where they've uh, been times of less than two hours and four minutes. Now London, one of the most interesting uh, marathons is going to be in London this year. Perhaps they'll be successful in London. Dubai is perfect, and they have money. The problem in Dubai is that uh, the climate is not ideal, it's too warm even in January, and then there's Valencia, which is one of the best circuits. They've really uh, worked hard and getting the right route. And there'll be a lot of good runners there. In terms of climate, the perfect climate to get the best uh, performance in the marathon is at about five degrees, slightly below. And it's difficult to get that in marathons because the temperature of five degrees is quite cold. So some researchers who suggest that perhaps it'd be interesting that the big marathons that take place in April and October occur in March or November to try and find slightly colder temperatures because that's better for performance. Or what's the problem? Well, it's that if in March and November, it's more likely that you have rain or, or wind uh, that's more likely that you have very poor conditions, so that's quite difficult. The only marathon of very high level that you have in the, the, these, these dates in um, spring and autumn is the marathon in Dubai, which takes place in January. That's above all because the climate in that part of the year, in that time of year, uh, or the climate in that part of the world is very, very hot, so it's very difficult to get good performance except if it's in January. And in terms of drafting, We've learnt a lot from um, breaking into a night and, and from others. And there are wind tunnel studies. Well, here you can see how running against the wind behind a car are just the kind of paces or, or behind the paces and the car. That makes a big difference. Now you can get three or four percent uh, uh, improvement. Um, just with doing things the right way. So the part, they're using high level paces and with this inverted arrow shape that the, and with the car, ideally electric, so that there isn't uh, exhaust fumes. Then if they do all of this, then it's gonna happen. What's the problem though? The problem is getting pacers who were prepared to, to sacrifice a marathon just to be a pacer for somebody else. You need, you need a lot of money to be able to, to do that. It's difficult for an athlete who is able to get to 30, 35 kilometers as a pacer is going to give up doing the, the marathon and, and not try and win. That's very difficult to get these pacers to, to go right to the end. But the non-standardized cases, it seems that the pacing and drafting is, uh, is very, very important. So the research group has published some articles showing that pacing should be very stable instead of starting very quickly or starting slowly and, and, and then speeding up. It seems that the recent records is that the variation coefficient between sections and also compared to the first half and the second half tend to reduce. The variation coefficient 
that what it's showing is that you have to be stable throughout all the different sections. That's difficult to have a completely uniform rhythm throughout the whole race. Perhaps the ideal thing from a strictly physiological point of view would be to try to get the athletes uh, run at a very stable uh, pace. That's very difficult. It's very psychologically difficult as well. But probably that is the right route to go down. And the aim is to get paces who are able to maintain a very stable pace throughout the whole run. And in terms of nutrition and hydration, this is some information from a young researcher, Hector Vidibai, who published a very interesting article where he compared different percentages of intake of uh, carbohydrates in uh, mountain runners. And he saw that consuming up to 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour, which is a lot, has certain advantages. There you see lower concentrations of certain markers of transaminases and, uh, and creating kinase in, in the blood. And so it seems that if, a, if an athlete can train to consume a lot of carbohydrates every hour, they could have a competitive advantage in a marathon. This was done. If this could be applied to, uh, to marathon runners. And there are some researchers who are trying to apply this, and they're doing hydration uh, studies. Now, from, in terms of equipment, this is also very important. We have to remember that the non-standardized attempts required a change in the law, in the rules. And since the 31st of uh, 2020, the rules have said specifically that the sole can be no thicker than 40 millimeters. That, that takes out the alpha fly, which is the, what achieved the, the, allowed them to break the, the two-hour record in Vienna. And the shoe must not contain more than one rigid embedded plate or, or blade within the, the shoe. So the alpha fly that had three uh, layers of, of carbon would no longer be acceptable according to current rules. And so anything that does meet these rules, not that we're seeing uh, models with uh, in, in various different brands. The various brands that are, uh, are working on this and the technological revolution which already began is going to help with this. And so this will be something that can help to break the record. So here's the last factor, which is also the athlete himself. But to see who the ideal athlete is, we see that in the last 20 years, the type of athlete has changed. Now, the run is a lot shorter than they used to be. A, a smaller uh, body weight helps in thermal and heat regulation. That's something very important in success. Now, the smaller the athlete, the more efficiently he can uh, lose and gain heat, and that improves performance. And then there are other factors as well. If you just think about the, the East African athletes, a number of studies show that they have a certain gen genetic predisposition for long distance rate running. There's a, the mitochondrial gr blood groups, in fact, that, uh, that help, but early life factors as well such as a lot of physical activity during the childhood, a prenatal exposure to uh, high altitudes, uh, and also anthropometric and biomechanic uh, um, factors. They've got low contact times, little uh, oscillation while running, and uh, uh, an enzyme uh, profile, which is very favorable, uh, fiber uh, composition, traditional diet in Kenya and uh, Ethiopia, for example, in Kenya. They, uh, they eat a lot of duvali, which is a, a carb pasta, which is consumed a lot. There's a the type of training as well, live high, train high. So they, in the, in the, they train at altitude. There's motivation for uh, economic success as well. And there's the brain oxygenation, which is very stable. And, then, and there's also, they've done studies with, uh, Japanese have studied this, and there's uh, the tendons as well, 
react tendon reactivity, which is optimum. No, there's no perfect athlete, but if you have all of these, it's, you're unlikely to get all of these factors in the same individual. Now, now there's skin and genetics who meets a lot of these factors. It's very difficult to see all of this in the same athlete, but it is actually common in Africa. So it's very likely that the, the athlete who does break the two hour record will be a, uh, an athlete born in the, the Rift Valley in, the, in East Africa, so in, Ethiopia, in Ethiopia or Kenya. And uh, we're going to see it sooner than was believed recently. That's all for me. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any questions, then I'd be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you. Jordan. Miguel Cardona is asking, how can we calculate this without laboratory uh, equipment? Uh, maximum oxygen consumption can be calculated in various ways, but the problem is their estimates. One way, and the most classical way, is, for example, using a Cooper test. In the Cooper test, there are four minutes that allow you to make these estimates. There's also six minute tests. There's the Van der Waal test, which is incremental. They're not that reliable, but uh, they're acceptable, and they allow us to estimate the maximum oxygen consumption without the needing, without having to use uh, laboratory equipment. It's quite a simple Cooper test. Thank you very much. Fabio Gerlado is saying, do you know the maximum oxygen consumption of Mick Chugger? Well, the results that uh, Nike had for the breaking two weren't published. I believe that Kipchoge is more economical than Podasandre. So I think that Kipchoge probably has a, it's probably about 160 millimeters per kilo per kilometer. And the maximum oxygen consumption, I think it's less than 80. But that's just an estimate, I don't know. I don't think the, the figures have been uh, published. Okay, last question from Monica Tangarice. How many years can high performance last in a, an athlete for marathons? Well, well, it's quite a long time. In the 90s, we saw world champions uh, who were veteran, like, for example, Martin Fieth and, and Anton were very successful in the 30s. And, and Jeves Alvarez is going to soon talk about Javi Guerra, who managed to get his best uh, run well into his 30s. And Kipchoge is getting his best uh, results well into his 30s. Now, in marathon runners, this is something we've always known. There are people who run excellent marathons well into the 30s and so there are certain premises that they don't have any major injuries and they take care of themselves but a marathon runner can get great results uh, for, for a long time look thank you very much thanks for this wonderful presentation how can we see each other in five minutes thank you very much thanks to you bye-bye
Good evening again. Let's uh, continue our session with uh, uh, Dr. Jesus Alvarez Herms, sports physiologist, PhD in physical activity and sports, sports training expert, and Olympic sports coach. Today, he'll be talking to us about key factors in training for high level marathons, uh, high level marathon training. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you uh, today. We'll be talking about key factors in high level marathon uh, training. I've been working with a few endurance athletes and I'll be talking about my work with them. I'll also be talking about the physiology of endurance sports. As Jordan said earlier, when it comes to training, the key word we always have to take into account is stress. Stress is a physical stimulus that we can exert on the athlete in order to achieve systemic change and strengthen all adaptive responses, um, all adaptive responses on a uh, local and systemic level. But there are four variables that we need to take into account when it comes to stress. Uh, variables that are closely related to training and that uh, can help us understand the role played by uncontrolled uh, stimuli in, um, in training. Uncontrolled stimuli uh, generate a higher adaptive response, of course, a higher systemic, uh, a bigger systemic change. That's what you have to take into account when you're preparing for a competition because uh, uh, it's a variable you want to minimize when you're preparing for a competition. Throughout my presentation, I'll be covering a few aspects that you might find bizarre, uh, but they're based on general criteria, generally accepted criteria on endurance training and phenotypes. Uh, some of the things I will be saying are a bit counterintuitive because ultimately I believe that it is sports that should adapt to athletes, but I'll get to it later. Uh, I'll also be launching a couple of questions that we'll attempt to answer later on in the presentation. I'll be asking questions about the individuality of uh, um, athletes, the physiological growth and the physiological chronicle inertia in athletes that can uh, occur over the years. As Jordan also said in the previous presentation, marathon training uh, is a trial and error process, essentially. And trying to, and it's based on protocols that have already worked out for previous athletes in marathon uh, running or in other endurance sports. Uh, so we capitalize on technological knowledge that has been generated in this area and in other areas to optimize the performance of our athletes and optimize uh, uh, also uh, our training planning. Uh, parameters uh, we normally measure include, of course, VO2 max, as well as systemic functionality, uh, which uh, varies greatly depending on the specific individual, the specific uh, athlete we're working with, along with the stimuli we subject him or her to. There is a lot of uh, literature uh, available on marathon, uh, traditional studies generally talk about, talk about volume and masses and allow us to adapt our training schedule to the specificity of the athlete we're currently working with. Performance isn't solely based on how many kilometers an athlete uh, can run or how f fast they can run. It's also based on their adaptive response in the long run, as Jordan was saying. Successful athletes are athletes who have been able to overcome obstacles and uh, generate an adaptive response uh, in their adulthood physiologically. 
and by adapting, they, they have improved, they have become better athletes. So today I'll be talking, as I said earlier, about individuality, physiological uh, progression, growth, maturation, and uh, uh, modular training. Everything that can be measured can be improved. That's my philosophy. And uh, it is down to us to use the technology that's available to us to measure all of that and help our athletes improve. When it comes to specificity of cellular response and uh, regulation, as Jordan also said, X. Our central nervous system plays a central role here. It acts as a regulator for all biological responses, responses both centrally and peripherally. And as a result, our sensor cells, which are tasked with receiving this information throughout the body, generate a response, which in turn translates to perceptive sensations, um, increased uh, blood pressure, uh, incle increased pulse, increased temperature, and so on and so forth. You have to take that into account because the first thing we have to take into account is the phenotype of uh, our athlete. Is our athlete a specialist? Is he not a specialist? Uh, is he able to adapt? How does he respond, for example, to hypoxia? Uh, we have athletes who, are, who have great metabolic conditions, others that don't. We have athletes who respond uh, really, really well to everything, but they aren't exceptional in anything. So it all depends on the phenotype. Uh, the physiological conditions of a marathon runner of, or of an endurance sports specialist are largely based on systemic notions uh, such as oxygenation, temperature, ventilation, which we'll be covering later in this presentation. So all of that needs to be taken into account. And uh, when it comes to performance, performance is basically the expression of an athlete's systemic functionality. When you consume oxygen, that's not the only thing you do in your uh, um, engaging a number of muscle groups and organs. Uh, so that's a complex reaction and it's something you need to be able to accurately measure. And um, that's important in order to enable us where we have to act. Do we have to work with the athlete in terms of, uh, I don't know, improving uh, uh, oxygen consumption capacity, uh, cardiac capacity, and so on and so forth. So specific interventions. So in training, in my opinion, it is a mistake to adopt uh, training philosophies that have been used uh, elsewhere because we all have different phenotypes when we're born, when we grow, etc., etc. As the picture clearly shows, not all athletes respond in the same way to a given uh, stimulus. And uh, you have to take into account physiological plasticity, the stimuli athletes are exposed to over the course of months and years. And we have to calibrate those stimuli in order to draw the maximum uh, potential out of a given athlete's phenotype. So specificity is a key concept to me. Genetically speaking, we know that compared with a chimp, our genome varies minimally. And when it comes to specific systemic specificity, with a view, for example, to improve thermoregulation or oxygen extraction capacity at a peripheral level, or uh, when it comes to improving cardiac capacity. Um, well, th those are the strategies that can generate the biggest change. So the smallest difference can actually 
make a big difference if we calibrate our stimuli to the phenotype of the athlete. As Jordan was saying, genotype is something we have to take into account. Uh, in Europe, there are lots of athletes that have a lot of potential. I don't think that all athletes with the uh, uh, right genotypes are located in Africa. The difference is that they are open to excellent stimuli since uh, birth. In Europe, that's not necessarily the case. And as a result, uh, our athletes sometimes are unspecific in their responses. And that translates in a four minute difference, the four minute difference there is between the best European athletes and Africans. But the specificity of training goes beyond that. We also work by taking into account circadian rhythms because there is a degree of individual individuality in the systems of each individual. There are studies, molecular and uh, uh, genetic studies that claim that one's gene expressions vary throughout one's life and across genotypes. And that's potentially a fundamental aspect that would enable us to successfully adjust stimuli. That's something actually we measure uh, about every five weeks in order to uh, work on, I don't know, uh, heart ca capacity, cardiovascular capacity, uh, thermal regulation, and so on and so forth, in accordance with the potential that the specific phenotype of our athlete is. So talking about the physiological demand in marathon running, there are lots of proposals out there and lots of studies which are very, very accessible to the public. In our body, there are limiting biological factors, limiting environmental factors out there as well, biomechanic factors that can alter performance. Non-specifically, as I was saying earlier, being able to quantify the response uh, of a marathon runner in terms of the strength training they do or uh, however far they run in a given week. To me, that's unspecific um, because it's not taken into account all these limiting factors. Uh, for example, a respiratory metabolic reflex is a limiting factor and should be taken into account. Uh, an impaired capacity for acidosis synthesis is also a factor that should be taken into account. All of these aspects in high-level athletes supposedly ha should or should have already be considered, but there is a degree of individual specificity, nevertheless, that I've observed, for example, in athletes who are unable to oxidate fat or do so to a minor extent. So some phenotypes are non-adaptive to certain stimuli, and as a result, uh, some specific uh, training regimes can uh, lead to injury. So that's why you need to be able to actually predict how the system will respond to the stimuli that you expose your athletes to. Different systems uh, hold a different weight within the body's integrity in terms of threshold changes over time and homeostasis. Uh, I'm not talking only about metabolism here. I'm talking about all systems across the body. I'm talking about respiration, uh, thermoregulation, uh, endocrine function, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you should be taking the whole thing into account and should always be chasing after this uh, physiological inertia, this uh, long-term growth. So specificity in marathon training. To me, when it comes to preparing for a marathon or any other endurance sport, something that has significant uh, physiological involvement, There is a difference between preparing for a marathon that's run in optimal conditions and a marathon that's run in specific uh, uh, conditions, conditions that are not optimal. Um, 
and when that happens, you have to take several other things into account, not only the pace, the rhythm, also other physiological conditions that are activated, humidity, uh, altitude, situations where the whole physiology, the whole system, the whole set of systemic components that could generate uh, a significant acute systemic change and minimize performance. Why is that? Because physiologically speaking, these senses, these perceptive thresholds and these physiological conditions haven't been properly trained. So that's an important concept. Specific preparation, differential preparation, specificity of uh, training. I've prepared a table here that I worked on because I wanted to show you how, in my opinion, a stable paced marathon can entail five to six physiological phases, which can be worked in each and every training session. We can adjust uh, uh, the systemic response of the athlete to those five, six phases, working with uh, specialized cell activation and whilst monitoring uh, the whole system, respiration, hydration, and so on and so forth. Just activating several different regulators, engaging the central nervous system as a whole. The vast majority of the time for a marathon runner, we work in a stable phase for 65 to 70 minutes where uh, the metabolism is uh, highly engaged on a systemic level. But here, it's also important to minimize the oxygenization effects with a view to reducing uh, this uh, metabolic expense. And I'm sure you've heard about the 60 minute barrier, 60 kilometer barrier occurring at about one and a half hours into the race. This, uh, after this uh, phase, after this barrier is, uh, after an athlete goes through this barrier, the system is engaged in a different way and uh, the system uh, as a whole responds in a different way from a perceptive point of view and training needs to take that into account so you can see what sort of uh if athlete can perceive physiologically and uh, what sort of uh works they the task they can have that you have to invest a lot of time in measuring one of these factors and then you have to have very specific uh, uh, actions. <clears throat> I like talking a lot about these sorts of stimuli. When we talk about effectiveness in training and of the physiological response, we have to realize that The best sort of tempo and change of rhythm is whatever is effective for our biological response. But we can't graduate this because in the long term, though you might require adaptive changes. There's also a predictive uh, biological uh, adaptation, which will always be effective. because it's the one that allows all of this biology and all of these potentials that we have. So sometimes we have to select it, sometimes we have to try and be objective with the uh, athlete we have, and above all, to strengthen all of those abilities that make the, the athlete a specialist. So in the case of Javier Guerra, this is a, an athlete who has a, a very clear specificity in certain aspects, <laughs> which we try to strengthen and try to minimize those where the, the physiology is less adaptive to try and minimize all of those uh, states that could uh, lead to a deficiency in terms of uh, performance. And we've also got the, the graduation of the thermal response in the mouth and uh, regulating heat is very important. This has been described in various papers. There are some athletes who are able to reach a higher 
temperatures and those who have the best uh, performance in uh, in in uh, in marathons and uh, and we have to work on a certain plan now there are studies that say that in six months you can improve things to a certain percentage but normally this is something that uh, this is in a random uh, percentage of the of the uh, athletes and so it doesn't always work so it's important to graduate the individual response in all different systems and to try to enhance those skills where the athlete is uh, excels so have to, that's very important it's important to understand that the, the, these issues such as epigenetics. This is not something that happens in just a, even in a month or two months. Uh, epigenetics is something that needs to be worked on. We need to work on the sensors and regulators for months. My experience is there's between 12 and 14 months of specific work and a, and a systemic level and different responses and different regulations where the body can then increase its uh, performance plateaus and the gene, uh, gene response and the uh, cell adaptation and systemic adaptation. Now the cells have to communicate with each other as well, and that's the key, <coughs> the communication between systems and above all the physiology that's generated over the long term. Here we have a clear example of different uh, athletes who've worked uh, in, in this way. And they've managed to have exceptional results. For example, here we see some examples. Who is able to perform at the same level as Africans? We've got uh, other Europeans who have been spending time in Kenya, and they have the same routines as the Kenyan athletes. They're not at the same level as them, but they they achieve an excellent level such as the came of Julian Warner, Hawkins. So this is very important to bear this in mind because uh, the short-term acute responses, I think, don't constitute a genuine response other than just peak performance, and it's, they're short-lived. It's important to vary the days uh, in terms of what's... Uh, potential responses in the long term. So it's important to remember that, as I said before, it's important to enhance those physiological, innate adaptive physiological responses and the, the diet of the area where they, the, the people live. That's uh, the one you respond best to because of genes, because of the environment. So it's important. The diet works for them because they're adapted to that diet. When I talk about adaptation, we're talking about chronic responses, not uh, adaptive responses in the short term, and which can be reversed. That's what happens when people have four weeks of uh, hypoxia and then they, and that changes. So this is this is something that is short-lived and which, in my opinion, you know, if you look for this magic response and you just uh, inhibit the adaptive response because you don't want to rest because the next so you want to do it to have a lot of volume and, and as i said the adaptive uh, reactivity is minimized and, and uh, reduces the biological potential so this is my view of things i move away from the usual um, acute performance curve and i like to look at systemic phenotype tissue mutability and the physiological threshold at all levels, not just. So the systemic demand, we've taken into account uh, ventilation. Ventilation has its own sensors, has its own regulation at the level of the brain. And above all, its effects in terms of uh, ventilation, whether it increases or decreases. The pressure thresholds at the alveolar level. All of these processes 
that we can measure from a simple point of view. They can give us a lot of information on lung variables, for example, because that's key between, uh, between 15 and 20, 15 to 16, uh, is, uh, is what we're looking at. Of course, so the running economy is very important. It's something you get uh, by improving all of these processes I'm talking about. And that means that you can improve muscular oxygen, you can improve the enzymes at the cellular level, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, various different things that can be improved over the long term. And with a systemic plan. When we talk about thermoregulation, it's important to remember all of these limiting factors. Now, in a normal training, it's not the same to, to train at 25 degrees at, at 15. Because of the hemoglobin, the, uh, the, uh, the oxygen transport is minimized. And so, so the pH conditions of the individual, the temperature, altitude, all of this has to be looked at. And that can, that's something you can work on to uh, an assist, at a systemic level. There's some things we can measure that can help us. For example, less fluid loss. There's also heat perception, perceptive uh, threshold, the osmotic uh, response. And another limiting factor, VO2 max. Often these athletes have certain capillary functions. And so we have to be very concise when we talk about limiting factors. So we have to be quite specific about what we're talking about. And it's a, it's a mixed bag of things, really. But that's a debate for another day. There are studies that, that can... We see that each study uses the best physiological strategy to obtain the best performance. Here we have two athletes compared, an African and a European. And we see all the, the, the variables don't change very much. The, the, the con oxygen consumption are quite similar. Different conditions in terms of heart rate or acidosis, variations in the oxygen concentration uh, in the arteries. And so we, we can't say what the secret of performance is because it's very much uh, an individual issue. Now, when we talk about individuals, we talk about the same thing. We see the, the oxygen response at the capillary level or, or per peripheral level. And this is very important to be able to see the uh, adaptive response in terms of hypoxia and acidosis and a lot of different situations. Before we talked about uh, lactate, which is the key limit to generate thresholds, but now we're starting to see uh, microbiome and intestinal uh, issues that can can create an improvement with different uh, we can feed the bacteria that feed on lactates so, so we can improve this uh, homeostasis of uh, lactidosis and even to work on those uh, levels now i've got experience on this and i can say that uh, i think in the coming years this will be a very important uh, approach So there, there are certain things I would propose, such as metabolic phases, which uh, produce uh, chronic adaptation, adaptations. For example, we, we generate work in these conditions, but not in one day it takes. So we plan not even not by weeks, but uh, according to the physiological conditions that we graduate day by day, according to all the different parameters that we can monitor. So I don't believe in specific times. I believe in, in the adaptive uh, response of the particular athlete. In terms of microbiomes, that's very important. Over the coming years, I think we should, uh, I'm gonna be very carefully looking at everything that's published in this area. Now we work at the level of genes and the physiology, and we try to 
we have a few more projects in which we try to uh, we, we combine polymorphic uh, issues with uh, physiology. We select different genes, polymorphisms, and so we is a comparison between a European and an African of H to H7 and an African of H4. So different uh, weights and polymorphisms. And so we see that there are some things that are stronger, that, uh, they're stronger than some things that are around. So there's a specific work being done on these athletes. Our work is based on individuals and the daily uh, adaptive capacity in different uh, thresholds and the response to stimuli. We look at the cardiac rhythm, uh, uh, the lung function, the heart function, biosynthesis at the, the level of the, the liver, creatinine. We measure, uh, we do a, a urine analysis. We look at internal temperature. We, we measure respiratory variables, everything that we can measure, especially stimulus response over the long term. Inertia and above all, the maturity of, and capacity of the individual athlete. I know I've gone very quickly. And I've gone quite uh, in quite detail and quite a lot of detail in some areas. But I wanted to give a general view of my work and above all the ideas I have on adaptive physiology and systemic uh, uh, physiology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesus. We have a question here. With progressive resistance training, can an athlete get to the optimum phase? So I didn't understand the first part. Could you say that again? An athlete with bravicardia and with progressive resistance training, can he achieve optimum performance? Well, this is something that can be induced by exercise itself or can be a ge genetic response. So bradycardia. So you have to specify more where it comes from. But bradycardia normally is, a, is often associated with uh, differences in the ejection fraction. But uh, you have to have... This is a positive effect for them. And so it can, they can improve the left ventricle force and, uh, and the ejection uh, force. And so the bradycardia in itself, if you don't specify exactly where it comes from, if it's induced by exercise itself, or by the characteristics of the individual, but it could be positive. Monica Candarice asks, well, first of all, thank you very much. What factors influenced so that the, they didn't reach the marathon time? Well, I don't know the particular phenotype of Talese, Well, it's just pure speculation. I don't think that all athletes are able to maintain the stable balance at a metabolic level, especially systemically, in such it's for so much time. So that's the specificity of each individual. There are athletes who who are, aren't who are particularly good at marathons because of the way they, they do acidosis, or or they're very stable in terms of the performance. So there are some who, who are specialists in, in uh, having a, a plateau performance in the, in the long term, systemically. So, <clears throat> so it depends on the individual. It depends on the kind of performance that they're best at. They might not be able to have the same performance in specific cases. But I don't have contacts with this particular case. So I, don't, I, often, I think that the, often I think the athletes they run, they do these, uh, these, these, they take part in this, and this is something specific of them. <coughs> They're prepared for this, and they develop this, and they are able to do their best. So often the systemic capacities are inhibited. 
but at 15, there's a, there's a loss. And I think the, often that's where the difference is. And not so much in the capacity of, a, of an athlete. That is my point of view. Thank you very much, Jesus. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And congratulations for everything that you've brought us. Thank you. Okay. At 7.20, we'll come back with Hanlo Lucia. Thank you very much.
Good evening again. Let's continue. We'll now be talking to Dr. Alejandro Lucia. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Lucia is a professor at the European University of Madrid, is an international leader in physical activity and health, and um, a world leader in uh, physical activity, health, and cancer. Alejandro today will be talking to us about physical activity as the fountain of eternal youth and um, as a, a powerful tool to combat diseases. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So my uh, presentation title is quite self-explanatory, but I won't actually be talking about uh, eternal youth. Um, I will be trying to demonstrate that uh, uh, physical activity is key in uh, preventing or treating certain diseases. So as a doctor and as a researcher, I study the benefits of uh, uh, exercise, uh, physical activity as um, a prescription tool. Uh, some people may argue that uh, that is not medicine, but it is. Physical activity, philosophically speaking, is, uh, well, everything that's about movement. Any time we decide to uh, walk up the stairs instead of taking the lift, which is not a good idea due to the COVID pandemic, by the way, every time we decide uh, to walk instead of driving, we're um, basically exercising. Um, it's not only running a 10 kilometer uh, marathon or race. So exercise produces solid molecular adaptation. And in epidemiology, that is different from physical activity. Physical activity can be going up the stairs and so on and so forth. But anyway, I think uh, it's important to remember to cast our thoughts back to the forefathers of this uh, discipline. The first one is A. V. Hill, an English uh, researcher, Alba Hill, who was the first one to talk about maximum uh, oxygen consumption. Uh, at the time, there wasn't a lot of pressure on researchers to publish and attract um, investment, and he won the Nobel Prize. He was the first one to realize that uh, uh, the more we worked out, our maximum uh, oxygen uh, consumption eventually would reach a plateau. Um, we also call it VO2 maxed nowadays, is the maximum oxygen uptake. It's cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, basically. Um, VO2 max can only be reached when we're working out very, very intensely, which it, which engages large muscle groups. And this type of exercise is good for the heart. It's great for the lungs as well. The lungs are great at pushing out CO2. They're not as good at uh, pumping oxygen into the bloodstream. And it's great for, for uh, your muscles as well. So it's a great indicator, uh, but it's often independent of uh, other health markers, which we'll be talking about later on. Some of the pioneers in this concept started working out of the famous fatigue laboratory in Harvard University. One of the forefathers of uh, nutrition is Matrico Grande Covial, and he worked precisely at the fatigue laboratory of Harvard University. Uh, a lot of different researchers from different uh, fields worked there. And they were coordinated by David D. Bill. That's the beauty of science. And back in the 20s, this person, Clarence Demar, won the Boston Marathon multiple times. He was studied, much like nowadays we would study any marathon runner. And through him, we found out a lot more about uh, VO2 max. So that was a parameter back in the 20s already. I'm going to turn off 
uh, the sound here. This medicine student who later went on to become a prestigious neurologist, Roger Bannister, was the inventor of high interval training because he didn't have a lot of time to train because he was a medicine student. And he was able to uh, run a whole mile in under four minutes for the first time. The so famous four minute mile was thought to be an impossible achievement. Uh, however, Roger Bannister was able to break that record and actually broke it twice. He published a number of interesting studies on hypoxia on a very prestigious uh, journal, Neural Physiology. And he showed that perhaps the physio physiological limits of human beings can be pushed a lot uh, farther than we would have thought. And then uh, medicine textbooks tell us, which is what I studied because I studied medicine. Uh, we also owe a lot to Scandinavian physiologists such as Peter o. Ostrand and Bengt Salton, who unfortunately passed away uh, not so long ago. Thanks to them, we nowadays have a tool, a portable tool that we can use to measure an athlete's uh, VO2 max. Peter O. Ostrand was the first doctor to ever measure uh, VO2 max in athletes using that portable tool. Anyway, the important thing is that through very elegant uh, experiments, this plateau, this VO2 max is limited by our uh, heart's pump capacity. And this is a field of study uh, that's been looked at with a lot of interest uh, since the 70s. Uh, Eastern runners or Southern runners don't have a higher VO2 max than European runners. They simply consume less oxygen, but that's a different thing. Um, this is a mechanistic experiment, as you can see. In this case, researchers introduced tubes throughout the main arteries and veins in the body in order to measure the amount of blood that's pushed through the muscles in a trained athlete. And this researcher, Mr. Salton, also said that the athletes are going to change medical physiology textbooks. And even more interestingly, Fred Burke said that medicine and physiology textbooks shouldn't be written on normal people. They should be written on athletes. They're the ones who really are able to push beyond uh, the limits of physiology. Elliot Kipchoge was an incredible athlete. He was able to run a marathon in a little over two hours. That's a world record. Um, truly, the human body has no limits, except for a number of years we can live as mortals that we are. And researchers seem to agree uh, that although it is important to lengthen, extend our lifespans, apparently it can be extended to up to 130 years of age, they're also uh, paying a lot of attention to augmenting uh, elderly people's physical capacity. I don't think we'll ever be able to live forever, but what I do believe is that we'll be able to make sure that human beings are able to increase, will be able to increase their um, capacity to produce strength up until the day they die in the future. So we've had um, a few talks already about marathon uh, runners. Some people believe that East African endurance runners uh, are blessed genetically, but that's really not it. This phenotype Or rather, I should say, when a whole phenotype uh, is so superior to another one, uh, given physical activity, the factor is almost always environmental. And in this case, it certainly is. The environmental factor in this case in East Africa is that children spend most of their time running barefoot. When they go to school, they run to school, they run out of school, back home, regardless of, their, of other social and economic factors. And I was lucky enough to take part in a genetic study on the genome-wide scan, a study whereby hundreds of common genetic variants are measured, were measured. We studied polymorphisms in a single nucleotide. We have millions of those. 
and uh, it transpired that there is no genetic advantage to East African runners. The reason they're so much better than everyone else are purely environmental. So this is Eritrea, a very poor country. We know that poverty helps forge great runners. We're lucky enough to test this runner who was one of the best runners about 10 years ago in a world championship in the juvenile category. See how long his legs are. Little uh, uh, muscle development in the calves, so less oxygen consumption and a very, very strong ventricular uh, capacity, which is uh, actually a bit rare in Western society. The right ventricle is very, very dangerous to interfere with. Overloading its capacity can lead to serious diseases, uh, in particular to pulmonary hypertension. But uh, this runner, although he had this disease, he wanted to get out of poverty. And he said, I don't care about what disease I have or I do not have, I want to keep on running. But let's uh, talk about evolution for a bit. Human beings are very vain, but we shouldn't be really, because after all, we're an ape. But we do have two characteristics that set us apart. We live longer. We have a higher capacity to store fats. We have better cognitive skills, for better or for worse. And with that comes something else, a different, different physical capacities, different physical skills. Um, we're the only ape that is able to basically walk on two limbs the whole time, the only full bipeds. Um, back in the day, apes had to compete over food and the bravest, uh, the apes who later on uh, developed into humans had to go out hunting during the day, which meant they had to walk on two feet, uh, bipeds. That's how we've evolved. And that's why we've evolved the way we have. Um, we've become fatigue resistant. Uh, we're able to walk, we're able to run, we're able to withhold exposition to the sun in Africa. And uh, female gorillas and female apes, because they were nomadic, they had to carry the children. Uh, they had to keep on walking on all fours because it's more convenient. So those are the differences. So there have been genetic changes and we have become more resistant. The speed gene is one of uh, these uh, uh, genes that I just mentioned. As we left Africa and moved into Europe and Asia, we became better endurance athletes. As a genotype, we became less explosive, which entails no advantage to our species, and more resistant, more capable of uh, withstanding long distances. Lions are very explosive. They're able, thanks to that, to kill animals that are much bigger than them. Cheetahs are able to jump uh, up to three meters uh, off the ground. We're not that. We're this. Of course, there has been some degree of natural selection since then, but essentially we haven't changed so much. We're exactly the same species as we were 40,000 years before Christ. Uh, when uh, if you couldn't hunt, you couldn't live on. And it was necessary to be active for long hours every day, chasing antelopes and other animals, withstanding heat as well, high temperatures if necessary. There are still ethnic groups throughout the world that uh, subscribe to that lifestyle, like the Hazda in Africa or the Simene in South Africa or other groups in the Amazon, along the Amazon River. Uh, these uh, genetic groups, these tribes often die young due to infectious diseases, but they have little to no cardiovascular diseases. Uh, 
they train a lot more than is recommended by the WHO. They train two to three hours every day, which equals about a thousand kilocalories uh, per day. And the recommendation for most people is about 2,000 calories. Our organism is designed to burn a thousand kilocalories every day. So we're basically eating more than we should. So it's more a problem. Obesity is more uh, easily linked to lack of exercise than it is uh, to overfeeding. So this is how we've evolved the way we have through competition with other mammals and other monkeys, other apes, we have developed a muscle group known as myokines. They're actually endocrine glands. These myokines and exerkines, these molecules are responsible for most of the benefit that we get from physical activity and exercise endemically because they can reach uh, most tissues. They're even able to cross through the hematoencephalic barrier. Who was the first person to show that muscles are able to produce myokine? It was Ben Solzin. Who else? There are two kinds of scientists, boring scientists and scientists who keep their eyes open all the time and who are able to draw relevant conclusions. Solzin saw the, the level of a cytokine known as interleukin-6 were very, very high. This also happens when we contract an infection. And when it's very, very high, it means that uh, we're at risk, we're a health risk. So a boring scientist would have said, perhaps, so exercise is inflammatory, it's bad for you. But Sultan didn't believe this. He said, no, these interleukin-6 levels are too high. What happens before and after a marathon? Isn't it maybe that muscles produce this molecule? And he found out that, that was the case. He carried out a, a very elegant experiment, a very well-controlled scientific experiment, because he performed it with a control group, contracting one muscle and uh, keeping the other muscle at rest. He drew blood from both femoral uh, veins, the right leg, which was performing the exercise, and the resting leg. What did he found out? What did he find out? There was a lot more IL-6 in the right leg than there was in the left leg, in the resting leg. Of course, several more studies were conducting, conducted into this to further confirm it. But I can tell you this, that about 20 years later, we know that uh, there are lots of different myokines and a lot of them still haven't been identified. And uh, these myokines are responsible for the benefits the exercise entails. And uh, even much more, it's not good for you to have high cholesterol. And it's not good for you to have high blood pressure, but if you're physically active, you have less of a risk. Interleukin-6 inhibits TNF-alpha, uh, which can be produced by deep fat tissue. And some myokins can even produce, can even have directly positive effects on our body, on our heart, on our pancreas, on our liver. Interleukins are pleiotropic. They have different um, effects. Other interleukins help improve, increase muscle mass, which also has to do with insulin resistance, so long as uh, muscles are kept metabolically active. It's important to conserve muscle mass, especially in the elderly. Muscle mass is essential to our immune system. Uh, that's something we've been talking about quite a lot in terms of COVID, and it's very, very important. I can tell you this. The myokines cause fat tissue, fatty tissue, 
So the white tissue. To turn into other kinds of tissue, fatty tissue is energetically very inefficient. So if you turn it into something else, that's an achievement. A lot of uh, different researchers have been looking into this in order to find out how we can prevent fat tissue to turn brown. Well, exercise is sufficient to prevent that from happening. We've made experiments on rats and mice, mice with cancer as well. And thanks to those experiments on rats and mice, we know that some of the uh, uh, molecules that are produced by muscles inhibit uh, cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. So it's very important. It's called oncostatin. The stressed exercise produces beneficial to our health. Hormones, the anti-stress hormone, by excellence, is adrenaline. When we work out, and the more intensely we work out, the better, we produce adrenaline. And NK cells, which I'm sure you've heard about due to COVID, they're basically our first and main immune uh, combatants. The name is natural killers, actually, and they're capable of killing cancer cells, uh, viruses, bacteria. And um, the more we work out, the more adrenaline we produce, the more NK we have uh, in our bloodstream. Studies have shown now, obviously, we're looking forward to finding a vaccine for uh, COVID. And studies have found out that if you work out before uh, the administration of a vaccine, the vaccine is more likely to be successful, especially if the uh, uh, vaccine is not very immunogenic. And this is especially true for elderly people. Some elderly people contracted COVID and have no antibodies left from that. And that's because their NK system isn't very powerful. But there's more. Muscles release IL-6 into leukin-6. And IL-6 helps mobilize NKs towards cancer cells. So exercise, we can conclude, can slow down and even prevent the development of cancer. Two hours after working out, the number of lymphocytes in our blood decreases. And NKs are lymphocytes. In organs such as uh, the lungs or the intestine, uh, Lymphocytes are absolutely essential, especially to combat uh, viruses. Uh, exercise is also good to uh, prevent breast cancer. And our ancestors, who used to walk every day to survive, also had another advantage compared to us. They weren't as stressed socially and economically as we are. Stress is terrible for you. Um, and stress happens when you feel like you're faced with something and obstacles you can't get past. It happens to everyone, it happens to me. And it produces adrenaline, but adrenaline in the lack of exercise is actually, actually has a negative impact uh, on your health and can lead to heart attacks even and heart failure. We're animals which have been designed uh, to release adrenaline daily, but when we're working out during exercise, not at rest. Myokin cannot be replaced by pills. Of course, some drugs need to be taken when it's necessary, but there are no drugs that are, that are as beneficial multisystemically uh, as uh, exercise is. All right, and there, let's look at some traditional risk factors. Exercise improves endothelial 
capacity of the ability of our arteries to dilate with uh, under stress. In exercise, we have more small arteries or that are wider with more volume and more collateral as well. This is the opposite of what happens with high blood pressure. So in that case, you have fewer uh, um, blood vessels and, uh, and uh, you remember the When they did studies in the 60s in the med medical journal, they looked at the autopsy of the, the runner, and they saw that the coronary arteries were quite free of arterial sclerosis. Another aspect, which can't be easily replaced, is that we produce adrenaline during exercise, but for the rest of the day, the parasympathetic uh, system uh, increases. An easiest way to see that is the reduction in the heart rate. Finally, when you do exercise, even if it's just one session, is more protected from the devastating effects of possible later heart attacks. This is because it conditions the heart. In fact, without knowing it, the first one to do cardiac preconditioning was the Eisenhower and the Second World War. He survived six heart attacks. They certainly didn't have the statins back then, but it was by doing exercise. It's not bad surviving six heart attacks. Now, despite all these benefits, half of all adults are inactive. They don't even meet the minimum as recommended by the WHO of 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous activity, such as brisk walking, not just window shopping. The WHO, the American School of Cardiology, uh, says that this is a major problem because uh, this problem doesn't start in, in adulthood. And what's particularly worried, worrying is that it starts in, in young children and, and adolescents. And the Gasol report shows that 70% of adolescent girls don't reach this minimum. As you know, the first epidemiological study showing the benefit of uh, exercise was done in London, published in the 50s in a prestigious uh, review, and it was uh, well controlled. We talked, it had a control group. They looked at drivers who don't, don't move, and the control group was those who, uh, who, the ticket collectors, who have to go up and down the stairs. Because as you know, in the London buses, the double-deckers, they, they have two floors. Now the heart mortality was much higher in the drivers, probably because they were, had a more sedentary job, although living in London is also a source of psychosocial stress. There's no, no, never such thing as a perfect control group. But now we know this very well. Regular physical activity, and the epidemiological studies have shown this, uh, is, a, is fundamental. And to have a certain maximum uh, of uh, oxygen peak of uh, more than or equal to 8 met. Now that's like jogging, like uh, slow running. It's not asking a lot because we're designed to do this sort of exercise. So if, you, if you don't reach these minimums, it's associated with all forms of mortality and a higher risk of uh, cardiometabolic conditions, depression, many types of cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. No, this is a, the romantic poet Roland Wordsworth talked about the benefits of, he, he walked 15 kilometers a day during 60 years. Or we can do a, a stage of the uh, Camino de Santiago, Santiago Way. Now we're definitely aerobic uh, uh, animals. We're supposed to walk, but, uh, but thanks because of the progression, the progress made in cardiovascular medicine, there are more and more older people, people who get to, to 80, 85 years of age. This is a really marginalized population. We've seen this with COVID, unfortunately. 
and that's, that's a great shame. A society that doesn't take care of its elderly is a great shame. It's, it's a source of shame, really. I mean, they, they've, they've raised us, they're these, these people, and we haven't given them back the love that they deserve. So here's that my father's muscular mass is not bad at the age of 80. Well, aerobic exercise is not so easy for them at that age, but as I said before, human beings, we are animals for whom muscular strength is not an evolutionary benefit. So even just a bit of a training, we, we improve very quickly, and this is what happens to elderly people. Their capacity to gain strength is almost the same as a young person. Here's some studies here with three people over the age of 90. And here, one of the outcomes of intervention. With a very simple intervention, the level of dependence of these people reduces. <coughs> I can assure you that uh, I've worked in these, these old people's homes, and the old people are really the forgotten group in society. No. There were these machines in Spain that have been set up for old people, but I don't know what sort of exercise they're supposed to be doing uh, with them. Now, I'd like to see gyms. Now, it's great to have attractive young people there, but it's also be good to have elderly people go into these, uh, these gyms. They, they, these places should be health centers, not just aesthetic centers. Now, a lot of elderly people are now confined, and there's with devastating impacts. And with uh, just a few days of hospitalization, can have a devastating impact on the functional and cognitive impact uh, co skills of elderly people. Often they can just they come out in a, in a they, they go in walking and they come out in a wheelchair very often. Now, movement has a lot of uh, um, improvements. So they they have lower mortality, uh, the lower falls, and the control group. They were talking to the people they're training. So they gain strength. And uh, just for three days, they, they become stronger. They can have the best hospital in the world, but uh, the elderly people are the, the forgotten community in our, in our society. And this is, this is for very weakened populations. We even do it in, in mice, as you can see with this poor mouse here. And just to summarize, levels of physical activity and cardiovascular health. What if we reach the minimum as recommended by the WHO? The color of the, of the arrows represent uh, benefits, green and, and red. And the width of the uh, indicates the magnitude of the benefit. So if you reach the minimum, that's very good. If you do something below, it's still good. I don't know if it's good to publish this because people say, oh, okay, well then just walking 10 minutes a day, then that's enough. But uh, what's really bad is to be inactive, to be sedentary. Not just not being standing up, but being sitting down for many hours at a time. This happened a lot in confinement. And what happens if we significantly increase what is recommended? Although it's not studied uh, in, in medicine, subjects who around the world participated with uh, who, who do physical activity at work and out of work, it's better than the minimum, the more the better. Now, there is perhaps a limit with certain types of patients with cardiovascular uh, illness, a ceiling effect. But I don't think we can really talk about excess exercise. It's very difficult to do much. The problem is not doing enough, usually. There are those who do too much exercise is about 0.1% of, uh, the, the, of the population, very, very small amount. What's really important is those who don't do enough. You can do exercise two or three times a day. Maybe aerobic is slightly better than resistance if you only do it once. And of course, the best thing is endurance plus resistance. And what about people who do too much? 
you're doing marathons and ultra marathons. Or maybe it's not so good, but I don't think it's bad either. I think the, the biggest risk is the uh, atrial fibrillation. We've done some studies on, on this. When you do exercise, it widens the, the atrium, becomes wider instead of elliptic in shape. And this is called a re-entry mechanism. Now, when we do a lot of exercise, the only the only risk that increases is that of our atrial fibrillation. That's the only thing that it can really, but that can be uh, well uh, dealt with. And to summarize, we need to do exercise because not doing exercise goes against our genes. How much? Well, the more the better. How? Whatever makes you happy, what you enjoy, if it's a dancing, walking, cycling, as long as we meet the minimum, do the minimums. Who should do it? Everyone. Everyone equally. And that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm going to ask a set of questions that uh, the listeners have asked. Oblis asks if interleukin is also produced when you do exercise after fasting, while fasting. Well, there's a lot of different interleukins. In the case of interleukin-6, it seems that when the glucogen levels in the muscles are lower, there's a higher production of interleukin-6. Well, I, I should say that it's a, this thing about training uh, without uh, uh, while fasting or intermittent fasting is very fashionable. I wouldn't do anything too extreme, though. Anything that limits my ability to do intense exercise. In fact, there's a macadal uh, illness, and there are people who can't use their muscular glucose, and, and, and constant flutosis. But the, and these people have a lot of intolerance to exercise, so I wouldn't do anything crazy in that respect. It's one of the advantages of exercise that we don't have to um, undergo extreme diets. We can we, we can have a you know I think it's best to have a healthy diet, nothing too extreme. And Antonio Vázquez asks, Ignacio Vázquez asks, why is an exercise not an immunodepressant? Well, because we don't know exactly why, but one reason is that the cells of our defensive system, especially the lymphocytes, are a first line of defense against tumors and viruses and bacteria. And, and lymphocytes T, which are the second barrier, like the first time we're exposed to COVID, for example. And the lymphocyte T is like the vaccine. Now, we, they have adrenaline receptors in the membrane. And so when we liberate adrenaline to the blood, which is the exercise uh, molecule, what it does is it stimulates the mobilization of these cells. And when we do exercise, it increases the, the pressure in the, the, the vessels and uh, the cells go to the center. And also the spleen, which is a, a, has a, squeezes like a sponge and that uh, releases a lot of lymphocytes. And also in general, our immune system, I don't have to talk about the immune system in depth, but the immune system is our whole body from our microbiome, the microorganisms, in our intestine, which are a lot more numerous than all of our cells put together, and then the, 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 the mucous membranes of the, of the nose. And now for all of this to function, we have to have a level, a high level of energy. And this high level of energy can only be obtained when people do exercise. And we have to have muscle mass, which is, uh, has enough uh, protein, and it also produces interleukins and immunomodulators, and even lymphocytes. It's been demonstrated. So I think we have to understand the immune system as our general state of health. It's the whole body. And that's been one of the main victims of COVID. The people, in some cases, their immune system was too weak to detect the virus. Okay, Salvador Cabello asks, 
how much exercise should be done before the, the vaccine. Well, I think you need to do daily exercise. Now, we hope this can be a vaccine soon, but I would do exercise just before the vaccination, for example. And I wouldn't be worried about exercise with having an immunodepressant uh, system um, effect. No, it might uh, maybe lower the intensity a little bit. You know, those who wouldn't go completely full out in exercise, but I would never stop doing exercise. Although I'm sure 99% of doctors would say the opposite of what I'm saying now. Veronica Biad says, uh, first of all, congratulations for the, the presentation and asks, if you'd like to know your opinion on why physical exercise is not prescribed as often as it should be. Or perhaps it's not a very nice answer, but because I think that in general, especially in the English speaking world, medicine is a business, unfortunately. And of course, the pharmaceutical industry is is, is very useful. It, it, it cures our, our diseases, and, but there are people behind there who want to be able to sell more money. And uh, the money that you can get from exercise uh, is tiny compared to what you can uh, earn from selling people drugs. There are a lot of researchers, in fact, who, who who actually want to create drugs uh, rather than telling people to do or exercise. You know, for example, myokines, so they want to produce a drug so they can sell it. You don't sell exercise to people. But I think the benefits of exercise, yes, it's not taught in, in medicine faculties, and it's not, there are no national policies in, or in very few countries. There are no adverts on what sort of exercise, exercise people do. People do it. A lot of people do do exercise, but not because there's any generalized incentive to do so. And what really draws my attention, and I'm a great admirer of, of Spanish uh, doctors, is that they're very good primary care physicians, but they, they always say, do exercise, but don't do too much, they say. And so people are then scared of doing exercise. They're worried that they might do too much. But it's nonsense. Okay, this is on the medicines program. Charlie says, how do you see the problem of teaching in medicines programs where they don't generally talk about this? And what do you think would be the role of graduates in, in helping this problem? Well, I think more about people than in uh, degrees, because if it for what I'd learned in the in my degree, then I it wouldn't be the same thing. I think I think you have to be constantly learning. It's great to have a university degree, but uh, to think that we're beneficiaries or slaves to what we've learned, uh, I think I do think it's a bit of a sad way of seeing things. So I think we're we're all part of this, and and the role. Of the of the graduate in in, uh, in in sports studies is is under undervalued. For example, these machines for elderly people, where I live in Larrojas in Madrid, it's very nice. I've seen elderly people doing this in uh, in the street, but I don't think they shouldn't have machines. The machines aren't important. What we need are people to to explain how to do things that science is comes from people not from machines and i think they're they're underused in in hospitals in general but the role of the of the the sports graduate and the physical health graduate is undervalued now in this country unfortunately we're always men against women it was like specialists against non-specialists left against right and uh, if we're constantly fighting each other we won't, we won't go anywhere in other countries, well, I participated in, in exercise against cancer. 
And no one asked, are you a physiotherapist? Are you, are you a physician? Nobody asked that. They just asked about their publications. Now, I wasn't able to go to the second uh, uh, version of this because not because of because I hadn't published enough uh, journals. That's how it works. Well, thank you very much, Alejandro. It's a great pleasure listening to you always. And, and on behalf of the university, I'd like to thank you for everything that you've uh, taught us uh, in this in this time. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Now, oh, to end the today, we're going to going to put the presentation of Dr. Jesus Revilla. Now, for, now he's a professor in the uni University of, of Madrid and, uh, and the CEO of the Polycore uh, company. And because of, now he wasn't able to come to speak to us uh, um, live, uh, but he's, uh, he's he recorded a presentation which we're going to put on now. And he's going to talk about myths and realities in fullness uh, fitness and for uh, teenagers. Thank you very much.
Muy buenas, es para mí un enorme placer eh, formar parte de este simposio, es absolutamente maravilloso eh, y me siento muy privilegiado de formar parte de este for elenco de profesores y de tener además a otro lado a varios miles de personas, eso es absolutamente increíble y no quiero dejar pasar esta oportunidad para eh, animaros a que tengamos esta This is an incredible uh, opportunity and one that I don't intend to pass up. Sociales o mi correo electrónico me podáis abordar, preguntar, profundizar, criticar sobre alguna de las ideas que voy a exponer. Este es un tema que a mí me apasiona y que además dentro del contexto en el que estamos viviendo ahora creo que nos da la oportunidad de reflexionar un extra sobre cómo vamos a afrontar en el futuro nuestro deporte y cómo vamos a jugar además las cartas que tenemos ahora. Voy a intentar además aterrizar las ideas teóricas a la práctica para que podamos interactuar con esa mirada eh, puesta en el día a día práctico más que en la teoría. En primer lugar, me gustaría lanzar una pregunta. Casi siempre suelo abrir mis presentaciones con esto. Creo que la preparación física en términos generales y en los deportes de equipo en particular ha cambiado enormemente en los últimos años. Si yo miro las planificaciones, las programaciones, los ejercicios que hacía hace 20 años, eh, prácticamente ha cambiado todo. Sin embargo, eh, es muy importante tener en cuenta que estos cambios no se han producido de forma aleatoria ni atendiendo a criterios de opinión, sino que han sido basados en la evidencia científica que ha ido progresando a una velocidad creciente. Me atrevería a decir que la curva del crecimiento de la evidencia científica ha sido exponencial. Cuando pensamos en la preparación física solemos eh, hablar de una evolución casi siempre en términos de materiales novedosos y no es tanto así. La evidencia científica nos ha aportado medios de entrenamiento con materiales nuevos, por supuesto, pero hay una parte muy, funda, muy importante, eh, absolutamente clave, que nos ha indicado cómo programar mejor, qué métodos pueden ser más adecuados, qué variables pueden cambiar la diferencia. Y al final de todo esto subyace una primera idea y ya linko con uno de los mitos más arraigados, que es el hecho de que el material es lo más importante. Y no es así. Hay variables que están por encima de los materiales que utilizamos. Por decirlo de alguna manera, los materiales son algo así como el tipo de medicina que vamos a prescribir, pero hay distintas medicinas que nos pueden dar, si la dosis es adecuada, si está bien prescrita, que nos pueden dar resultados óptimos. En definitiva, lo que quiero decir es que cuando echamos la vista atrás nos damos cuenta de que cosas que hacíamos, las abdominales o el trabajo de la zona central que practicábamos era claramente mejorable. Hoy incluso hay algunas propuestas que se estiman lesivas que hacíamos de forma muy, re muy reiterada, las flexiones profundas del tronco, la flexión más la rotación. Aún hoy, algunas de estas prácticas negligentes se siguen poniendo en práctica, eh, realizábamos permanentemente tareas, ejercicios eh, enfocados a la mejora de la fuerza eh, por detrás de la cabeza, los ejercicios tras nuca que hoy sabemos que esa abducción con rotación externa, sobre todo si añadimos carga, repetición, etcétera, puede tener un riesgo lesivo importante. Eh, no éramos tan conscientes de la importancia de mantener el rango neutro en las curvas del raquis, especialmente en la curvatura lumbar, y hoy sabemos que eso es capital. Hablábamos de las pesas como un medio a utilizar, cuidado con ellas porque nos pueden volver lentos, especialmente en los deportes de equipo, ese mito que estaba tan arraigado que hoy sigue pesando ahí. En la actualidad ya sabemos que el trabajo de fuerza no solo eh, no camina en esa dirección, sino que consigue los efectos contrarios, es decir, nos aporta más rendimiento, nos aporta jugadores más... So we used to talk about weights. Antes se hablaba de la alta intensidad intervalada en términos de 
cuidado porque no es para todos, porque eh, hace falta tener un nivel de base aeróbico y un trabajo. Right, so strength training can help us build players who are more explosive, who are able to exert strength throughout a prolonged period of time and improve their performance. We often talked about intervals with caution. We kept saying that high interval, uh, high intensity interval training isn't for any, for everyone because uh, it is fundamental uh, to work out at a moderate intensity before moving on to that one. But we know that to be false now. When it comes to flexibility, mobility, stretching, we also thought uh, the wouldn't be indicated for professional athletes. But now, on the other hand, we know that working on mobility before a training session or before a competition is uh, absolutely key uh, in order to improve your performance during uh, a competition. We also often trained uh, uh, cardio alongside strength training. And now there is evidence that especially in well-trained athletes, the order should be inverted strength before cardio and actually separating um, strength training and resistance training. We also intuited that training hard was fundamental. And that is to some extent true. But what does it mean to train hard? Train hard means training while paying good attention to our technique and not simply training to exhaustion, especially if our goal is to improve our performance. In particular in uh, team sports. We often used mono um, articular exercises, exercises that would only engage one muscular group, but new evidence shows that these exercises are only indicated for very specific situations where you have to compensate a certain imbalance that you have in your uh, uh, muscle groups. It's important to understand that the skill the skills rather that would make a difference beforehand and the skills that make a difference nowadays are the same ones. And that's very important. We must put this on the table and look at it for a couple of minutes at least because new technologies, new methodologies uh, and uh, a newly found uh, scientific evidence may contribute or cause us to lose sight of the fact that an athlete will achieve significant results if they are motivated, if they are determined, perseverant, patient, if they're able to maintain, to keep up the good, the, the, their good work over time. So this means the skills, those abilities that used to make a difference 10 years ago still do. And the physical uh, trainer, a personal trainer, should be aware of this. That's why I wanted to talk about it now. A good personal trainer needs to work with the athlete with a view to creating skills that can be used throughout their career patience, uh, perseverance, all of these skills, the skills that I mentioned earlier, are fundamental, especially if, for example, the, the athlete we're working with doesn't like to train hard. If a person, if an athlete doesn't like to train hard to withstand high pressure, we have to work on that. That's what I mean by skill development. To me, everything begins with the players understanding that uh, physical work is fundamental in their lives to improve their performance, their health, their wellness, and even their aesthetics. 
this is something I always tell handball players because anytime they have an opportunity to train and that's, this is why I'm showing you these pictures every single time they have an opportunity to prepare physically they jump right in it they understand it's fundamental not only in the short term but also in the long term um, for a number of purposes including their wellness and their sporting career so if we bear that in mind the first thing we should be asking ourselves and this is something we rarely talk about especially in uh, textbooks the first thing that you should be asking yourself as a personal trainer is how can I make sure that this person, that this player can hold physical preparation and conditioning in high regard? How can I achieve that? How can I get these uh, players to believe in my work? How? Well, there are several tools that we can use in this regard. Uh, I often uh, use uh, international, internationally important players uh, as a reference in this regard. If you listen to their interviews, the messages they like to launch are very clear. They always say that it's fundamental to uh, live a healthy lifestyle, to prepare properly, physically. They always say it. So I don't want to digress too much, but I think the take home message here for young people nowadays is this. We need people we need players who actually don't require us to uh, breathe down their neck all the time. We need players who are able and willing to take it upon themselves to take proper care of themselves. Players who say, it is in my best interest to show up to training daily. It is in my best interest to ask my personal trainer questions about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Personal trainers, on the one hand, this is completely true, always have, at least to some extent, to breathe down their neck. But we also need to show them that uh, they have to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, making our players more responsible is one of our main goals as a staffer in a given federation or club. Um, another important thing that, should we, that we should be mentioning in this regard is that um, young people who are training need to be aware of the importance of patience. And we should be telling them that uh, there is no miraculous um, method that we could employ. Scientific evidence, all that it tells us is that in, uh, in uh, short periods of time, four, six, eight, ten weeks, there will be changes. But there will be small changes. If you want your changes to be noticeable, well, those will take months to happen. These changes and the changes that truly make a difference are achieved after years of training. So, if we want to achieve long term change, we need to work closely with young people and explain this to them. Explain to them that great change is achieved over years. We need to convince them not to trust those who tell them that they can achieve great change in a very little time span. Along the same lines, I think it's important to subscribe to the rule, do not trust, do not trust, DNT, NTF in Spanish. There are some great examples out there, of course, that uh, young people can look up to, but there are also great uh, social and economic forces at play that force these uh, idols to sell products or methodologies that don't necessarily work. A well-balanced athlete needs to be able to differentiate information that is good to them from information that is not good to them. 
If those we're working with truly aspire to great achievements in the long run, they need to be patient. They need to uh, keep the hard work up for a long time. So moving on from this uh, short section, I would like to say that there are four key um, pillars we should be bearing in mind at all times, and that's not always the case. First off, expectations. Believe in physical preparation. Secondly, generate responsibility in uh, young players that we work with with regards to the expectations that they have of themselves and with regards to the change that they want to achieve. They should be aware that the uh, actions they take on a daily basis, the decisions they make on a daily basis will have a long lasting effect on their career. The stuff they work with are important, but after all, they uh, play a secondary role in their um, improvement pathway. Players play a pivotal role in their own improvement pathway. And that's something Jordi Rivera always says, and I agree with this. Another thing we should focus on is good habits, actions that through repetition can generate significant change in a player's life. And finally, transference, being able to apply those skills in competition. So on a daily basis, Young players can use a timetable like this one, like a template you can see on screen, to prioritize what they have to work on. It's useful. And it's a useful record both for the player and the coach to uh, be aware of what the situation is and if any mistakes are being made. It does really work. It's, uh, it's a useful tool. But now, let's talk about uh, some myths that I'd like to bust. I'll be quite quick, uh, but because I'm sure you're already familiar with this, but we need to talk about it nevertheless. Strength training should also go hand in hand with uh, other types of training. Uh, no doubt, but it's not true. It's not true that is that it's detrimental to our work. It does improve performance. Strength training optimizes development for uh, young people and for adults. And this is something that parents should be aware of because they're often wary of weightlifting and strength training at the gym. So the answer to the question, uh, should children lift weights at the gym? The answer is yes. Of course, they have to do it properly, though. Uh, that's very, very important. And um, it's not the medium itself that is uh, uh, determining and important. It, it's how you use it. It doesn't make any sense to talk about strength training. Like... Um, a positive type of training if you're only working with your body weight and uh, talking about weight lifting uh, like something that's necessarily bad for the kid that's really not it what really counts here is technique uh, if you have the right technique it doesn't matter if you're working with uh, weights or body weight and this is something i'd like to talk about for a minute um, because it's very very important technique always comes first let me say this right off the bat. Any exercise, if it's executed poorly, it won't yield good results. It might yield decent results in the uh, short term, but in the medium and long term, it will definitely be detrimental to the player's development. So we, as personal trainers, uh, we should make this very, very clear. We need to be adept at the exercises we have our players perform, good at technique. We need to be good at detecting um, failure, uh, 
technical failures and uh, technical mistakes. And it's important to be aware of several different uh, uh, variants of a single exercise. We need to be expert, um, experts at this. We need to be experts at um, modifying a given task according to the needs, the necessities of our player. Uh, working to exhaustion is not advisable. And I'm being deliberately direct here, straightforward. As soon as the series is over, the player needs to have the feeling that they could still do a lot more. When I teach an eight-year-old girl to do push-ups, for example, at first I have her do the push-ups off of a high table or uh, off of a door, and we do perhaps 15 reps or 12 reps, and she needs to have the feeling by the time she's done that she could, if she wanted to, do more. And so, regardless of, uh, of where you are in the learning, if you don't have to do the exercise, you have to feel, you have to know what direction you're looking in. And we can, uh, once you want to understand the technique, you have to be able to activate the muscles. Notice how the chest muscles are activated. And once uh, athletes know the technique, they try to improve their strength, which is directly related to sporting performance. Then you need to uh, perform it at the maximum speed. Now, there, there can be uh, shades of gray. <clears throat> We'd have to make the movement active. So if you're doing any squats, then get up and increase the speed. And you get to a point where if you're doing it quickly, then they say to rate, rise even more quickly. And even if you might jump off the ground, that's okay. It's not a problem. So there's that focus on speed and on, uh, on uh, performance. And you can kind of somewhat forget the technique. And then all the focus is directed on maximum velocity. And so this strength is much more based on technical quality. And once you have that, the muscular quality, so the maximum possible velocity, and not so much on the percentage of the load. Because that's going to be a, a small load. Now, this is quite important here. Is a, an initiation session where it doesn't last longer than 20 minutes. And it's very simple. If you're quite clear about what the important variables are. So we see the focus is technical and the velocity is controlled. The load is very low, so you could do a lot of rep reps. And here you see that the character of the strength is low. You do less than half of the reps that you could do, and you go to half at most. And here's a video. You'll be able to send you the links. So you'll be able to see them exercise by exercise. And with the technical tips. Once you've gone past this technical focus, but once you know how to do them, 
They can even do them with uh, these are players who, who start with their legs and finish with their arms. And according to the arm they lift up, that gives us a, an extra plus of specificity in terms of cognitive skills as well as an, in addition to physical challenges. Now, first of all, the technique has to be perfected. And secondly, you can see that the decision making doesn't take away too much from the power of the lift. This idea is fundamental because it can be used in young people and in young old people. So here we see an eight-year-old who's uh, doing an exercise like this. And it's a slightly complex task. It's a squat, which is connected to a uh, rowing mechanism. No, it's not just because it's an elderly person. The person is doing the task very well, but also he's in that intermediate point where there's not so much emphasis on technique. And you can say, let's do the rise slightly faster. And this is based on velocity. That's a, that's a better improvement. And so you feel when you finish the series, this feeling that there's a lot left to do, that sense of fatigue comes, so you don't uh, you don't do it to exhaustion, and so you're less likely to have problems in technique. And the final idea is that it's not the weights that are going to generate a problem if a problem arises. It's how you do things. So you need to really understand how to do it. Now, there's a very widespread myth that we need long sessions in order to get results. But scientific evidence, and this is what uh, um, my grandma used to say, it's good to do a lot of short things than to do a lot. So it's good to have small sessions that last a short time, but do it frequently. That generates very good results. And this is something that can be used in life in most people and in our teams. Then your teams, you can only train once or twice a week, but they can have a short session at home almost every day of just 12, 15 minutes. So they can have four, five, six sessions a week. So from 12 to 15 minutes, they can do these sorts of tasks. The squats, using series, where we're very far from exhaustion, six of 14 or 15. When we do this sort of exercise, you don't usually need more than 40 or 50. Usually 30 seconds is enough. So doing four series, that's not going to take more than four or five minutes. No. Here you see a torso, which is, is a, a very good for basketball. And here we can have a unilateral or, or a tertial movement, which is very good for a specific sport, but also good for general uh, performance. These are very interesting tasks. We can start before the Bulgarian squat by doing a step up, 
at maximum possible speed, jumping as much as possible, and being careful with how we land, working on the application of force, but also the ability to land on one leg, which is good, important for sport. So from a technical point of view, this is simple to learn. And if you progress well, it can really help you stabilize with the knees, with the, the heel. And it can yes, improve your stability overall. Now the Bulgarian squat, we saw before, and, and here we can implement, we can do these tasks in the street. And it's not just the explosive concentric phase, but also the issue of landing on one leg, which is important. Now, is it possible to include decision-making or not? Well, it's all going to depend on whether the movement is automatic. And the fact of having to make this decision, we don't want it to uh, undermine the performance too much. Now there is the poly interval high intensity. It takes a lot of time. Now I think we can do it in less time. There's some that says between five and ten minutes. And that leads to very positive results. It's a very small amount required. And there are alternatives like this one. They're very simple. Working with different balls. We can lift them up, put them down, pass them. And we can have high intensity, but also improve certain techniques. Maybe in the initial phases, it might be a problem with the arm, or a poor alignment of the hips, or, or a, a poor step. And uh, this is a lot of things that can be corrected. Now, these situations don't include much decision-making. They're very simple. And so there are lots of alternatives like this. Senses. We don't need to entrain for a long time. Sometimes at short periods, we can get very good results. And especially for team sports, we don't need a lot. We need to train well. And if we're constant and we have lots of small doses of exercise, that's very good. And to train very well, we need to make sure that we do it, things correctly. We don't need to get obsessed with using fashionable equipment. The important thing is that we have to do things correctly with the right technique. And ensure that the variables are the right variables. So the general moral is that technique is essential. There's no two ways about it. So here we have an annex where you can see different checklists for exercises and certain tips you need to look at every time we apply them. And we don't need to be too vigorous with them. There's situations of lifting and there are very common errors there. If you look at their backs, whether the, the chest flexion with the bar, often it's done very poorly and the, it's not corrected. Now, some practical applications. Well, the only way you can really do certain things correctly you have to repeat. You can't have too much variety so that you can be good at something. And we can 
get good at certain tasks. So the ex exercise selection is very important. Once we know the technique, we want to be able to apply the maximum velocity, as I explained earlier. Here's another myth, is that we need to rest 48 hours after lifting weights. That's not true at all. It all depends on how much we do. If we do a, a moderate uh, weight lifting after 6, 12 hours, we'll be, we'll be okay. So the length of rest depends on the type of session that we've done. It's not the same thing to train an hour to exhaustion on the same muscles to training all different muscles with very short exercises, short doses, and not going to uh, exhaustion. So it really does make a difference. One thing that's very important And I think this is something we should do remember. There's, there's a lot of fashions. But uh, in terms of performance, they're not always optimum. So we shouldn't be too bothered about following the most recent trends and fashions. In fact, I think it's essential to really understand these equipments, equipment very well, to know whether a particular training proposal is good for you. Is this better than a traditional jet or not? Well, the jerk gives more power to this movement and gives a greater load and allows a greater power if you don't do them with these, uh, this equipment. And it might not be providing what you think it is. Now I'd like to end by saying I think it's essential to know what to include and what not to include. And I personally use the POMO filter. I look at the exercise and I make sure that it adapts to the person to their requirements, to their coordination, to their capacities and abilities. If it's aligned with their aims, what does they want to do? If it's cardiovascular or in increased strength. And finally, the whether it motivates them, whether they enjoy it. Sometimes we're obsessed with motivation, but it's, it's an important element. And sometimes it's essential motivation. The motivation is necessary. That's all for me. It's been a real pleasure. I'd like to thank the organization for inviting me to, to speak. It's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you. And, and I encourage you to write to me. Here you have my uh, my email. And please uh, don't hesitate to write to me. 